Welcome to Middle Fingers Up, the show where we hold our heads high and our middle fingers higher. I'm your host, Kieran McKay. Today, we have two remarkable individuals who co-host the Unpacked podcast. You can follow them under the Unpacked pod. I'm super delighted to have Evan DeWald. He's also on Instagram as Recess Creek because he's an Enneagram life and business coach which we will learn about today. And we also have Tara Lindsley, who is also under the tag taralinsley.ca. Tara is a digital marketing coach, and both of them are joining me today. And I, I'm going to do sort of like a full disclosure because anyone that knows me knows like I can't, I can't lie and I don't know how to pretend. So I would normally at this point say something along the lines of I'm really excited to pick up our conversation, where we left off. And that would be because a few weeks back, Tara and Evan were so kind and hosted me on their podcast. And that's because we were sort of talking a little bit about how our paths cross in the podcast world. We like to talk about sharing stories. We like to talk about healing. Tara and Evan talk uh, really well about how to learn about your story. What is it? How do you figure out what your story is? Which we're going to talk about in a bit. But what happened is I'm just going to go into full on my middle fingers up right now and just like make this kind of like combine this middle fingers up to the AI that runs TELUS. I really feel like TELUS, there's no humans there. And later on when we have the apocalypse and it's going to be the AI one, we're going to find out that TELUS was behind this, making their AI robots while pretending to give us a service. They suck. Um, (laughs) But what happened is when I was hosting you last week, we did it virtual and my internet was so bad we kept getting kicked off we we tried for an hour you guys are so patient like going along with it and finally we're like we can't do this and so now you're here in person it's gonna be way better it's gonna be way better it's gonna be way better right so that's why i was gonna say i'm i'm looking forward to the conversation with where it left off because (laughs) we legit left off in the middle of it so uh so welcome thank you thank you for being here with me today how you guys doing Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah we're good. I'm excited about it. Yeah, me I'm too. glad we. I'm glad we got to come here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. Yeah, me sure. too. I'm glad too. It's it's so lovely. I I had an opportunity to talk to another local podcaster, Zach, who you yeah. you guys know. And I just I have to say, I was saying to my husband the other day. I you know m- many of us have the story of being bullied as kids, not having this sense of belonging, and so you're always trying to belong when you're bullied. But then also as a child who going through developmental stuff, you're always trying to belong to your peer group. And I just wish that I had that welcoming as a child in the way that I have in the last little bit since I've started with lovely podcasters like yourselves and Zach who have been so warm and welcoming and saying, there's room for more here. Mm -hmm. Come on over and let's build together as opposed to what I'm usually used to, which is what are you doing over there? I got to do it better. You you and I can't connect because that means that I, I'm going to get thrown under the bus. And so I just really appreciate the warm welcome. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited to get into where where you two sort of started and how that works. And you know what I think, on, honestly, on that, I'm kind of like when it comes to the podcast world, there are so many voices out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people find what they what resonates with them. Right. And so it's like, you're not going to compete with us. Yeah. 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 Right. Or or vice versa or whatever. In fact, it's really the way you grow. That's what I was going to say. And also it's a community. So if you're a podcast listener, you're already like, you find something else and you're like, oh, awesome. I have a new podcast to listen to. So yeah. Yeah. Right. And I would, I would also add like, most people don't realize that like anyone who's hosting a podcast is a podcast lover. Yeah. Yeah. They have their (laughs) own list of podcasts that they listen to. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I appreciate that. I think there's lots of room to grow together and build together. And like I said, you guys were really warm and welcoming and have a lot of knowledge, you know, as well with, cause you've been at this for a while. So can we get into it? Can yeah. we, can we, since I've already done my middle fingers up, I'll ask you yours <laughs> in a minute, but let's, let's talk about the story 
that led to, there's got to be a story that led to the Unpacked podcast. So how did you guys get started? Also, side note, I know this now because I learned it the last time, but going into the last interview, I had asked you, like, how do you even know each other? Because <laughs> I was trying to put that together up until last week, too. I'm like, are they, I, I don't think they're married because they've talked about their own families. Are they siblings? Are they friends? So we're friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Good chemistry for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We've been, mm -hmm. we've been friends for quite a few years yeah. and our, our, our families all hang out together and we have some very common similarities in our families yeah so we start working together which we'll get to at the podcast part okay. but i can tell you the family part yeah i was actually tara's husband's youth pastor when oh, he was a kid okay and uh, so when they moved to chestermere then we all kind of started hanging out a little bit more together yeah. but we have a lot of things in common in terms of we're adoptive parents yeah They've adopted from South Africa. We've adopted from Ethiopia. And right. We have another, actually our whole kind of pod of friends that, that hung out kind of, you know, pod is a new language. Yeah, now. yeah, there's yeah. Got so many the meanings. The pandemic deal, right? But it's like we, we, we all hung out together and yeah. all of us were adoptive parents. Right. There's four families and yeah. each of us had have children that are adopted. So wow, yeah. internationally adopted. Mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah. if you want to hang with us. There you got to adopt. Yeah, you got to adopt to be part of that club. <laughs> or you have to be from another country. So. <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> I could pass. There you, there you go. Yeah, you can be friends. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we know each other. But yeah. we started the podcast when we were working together um, for an organization. And for years, because Evan is a former pastor, I was like, hey, you're really good at talking. Mm. I bet we could figure out how to do a podcast. We already were posting sermons and things like that. And he kept saying no. Mm. He was like, no. No. And we have really good conversations behind the scenes with our staff, things we are learning and growing about. No, just still no. <laughs> it was so funny because I, I, I never actually assumed that people would want to listen mm. like to what I have to say or what I'm talking about or what I'm thinking about or all those kind of things. I can barely at the time I can barely be keep people awake during my <laughs> sermons. And so it was kind of like, Aww. why would anyone want to tune in on their drive to town or their, right. you know, all those kinds of things. And so, yeah, I was resistant to it until there was an act. It felt like there was an actual need. Mm. Right. So during the pandemic, then, you know, everything shuts down yeah. and we're no longer in front of the community we serve, like our city, but also the congregation and trying to figure out how do we continue to connect with people. And Evan was sitting on a couple of committees that were mental health committees that were telling us locally in our town that people were struggling mm. and looking for resources. And there just wasn't really ways to access um, more support. And so we were like, well, maybe we can help with that. Like a podcast would be a great idea to connect with people that way and offer free and accessible support yeah. that you could just do in the privacy of your home or on your walks. Like we were all going out for walks or cleaning your house or baking your banana bread or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You had all the no, things no, that you could do. It was sourdough. Oh, it was sourdough. Yeah. It was both. I remember a lot of banana bread. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It was both. Okay, okay. I don't think you were baking either. I was in the sourdough community. That's oh, okay. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's the so, next block over. Yeah. 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 So then we started, um, I was like, I can figure out yeah. how to do a podcast. Like I'm in marketing. I was like, I know how to promote something like this. I can figure out the tool of how to do it. And then Evan did a few episodes on his own. Which I hated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it was just, it felt very monologue yeah. kind of. I had done an episode that we actually used on a Sunday morning. Oh, okay. It was just a recorded Zoom thing with right. one of our local psychologists. And I was like, let's just do a conversation, talk about mental health on in place of the sermon. Right. Yeah. And she was a local lady. Uh, her name is Maureen and it went really well. Oh, I thought yeah. it was received well at church. Mm -hmm. I thought it, for those who were watching <laughs> yeah. oh, church, because okay, yeah. we weren't, we were we're online yeah, yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then I did a few episodes afterwards by myself right. and they, they are still in our list. Yeah. But I didn't like them very much. Right. And I was Tara's boss. Oh, you see, so at the time, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. So the good part was, it was you, like you had a great idea here that you're making me do. Oh, oh I see where this is going. <laughs> guess what? I'm way better when I'm talking to somebody yeah. than I am when I'm alone. So right, right, you it's got the job. Yeah, and also it was more helpful for like producing it and figuring out the direction of the podcast and those kind of things right. too to be in the room. But yeah, but like, I, how did you feel when you got asked? Were you excited, <laughs> oh, surprised? No. Were you like, what? Like, were, yeah. Yeah. Not surprised because he tries to push me out of my comfort zone often. Uh -huh. So not overly surprised. And I was like, I had this feeling of like, no, we do really work well together. I think it could work. Right. I just don't 
really like being in front. Yeah, that's fair. I just don't. I just would rather be behind the scenes. Right. So yeah, a little bit of it is that. And now what I've discovered, you know, we've since left that organization, but now what I've discovered too is like, I can listen like an audience person. And I also have the marketing background of figuring out like what's the audience trying to do and how are they going to connect with us and what episodes are going to work and those kind of things. So I get to listen kind of also as like an audience. And honestly, like it is such a, you have sort of this wraparound skill because I, as a as a host, pretty much when I turn off the mic, that's sort of where my creativity ends. I have the ideas, but you get to put them in practice. Like mm-hmm. I, I need support with the editing and the whole social media stuff is overwhelming. Yeah. And and so it's like, okay, we'll get we'll get to it as we go along. Like I'm not gonna get way over my head, but there's a few of you that I'm noticing the pattern is people that are in digital marketing make really good podcasters because yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a few now that I'm learning. I'm like, oh, that's that's awesome because you kind of get the whole the whole 360, I guess. Yeah, you yeah. do. Yeah, I, I think it's a natural thing for me. Yeah, it's, It yeah. is natural of just thinking about how we would get it out there and what people are listening to and yeah. what the, how you build a relationship with them is yeah. marketing. Totally. Your social so. media, so like Instagram, you guys, it's so nice and clean. The way that you post, your colors, everything, It's it made a lot of sense when I learned about your background. Mm. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is like next level professional. It's it's really well done. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah. yeah right. I have zero to do with that. That's why it's well done. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I would I love say. love the honesty. Oh, no, absolutely. For real. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> what I would say, though, is interesting is that when Tara joined the show, she really did come at it as a the marketing person who was going to sit there and listen and try to make sure that right. the conversation went yeah. in the right way. Yeah. But it, and we were laughing about it actually mm-hmm. on the way in because this consistently happens. We get in conversations and I talk a lot. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'll talk right away. I have no problem answering right. a question right away. Yeah. Oftentimes I'm, I'm getting better at this. This yeah. is part of my own personal growth, but oftentimes without a whole lot of emotion, I mm. respond. Mm. But Tara's a feeler and she'll sit there and feel. Right. And then all of a sudden, in some point in the conversation, she'll ask the just the best, the perfect question. question. Yeah. It, it, it's funny we laugh about it now, but but she had to learn that. Yeah. yeah, she had to learn to be brave and to do it. And it was yeah, it was like a year. Yeah, it took me of a long me time. kind of going. Okay, you didn't talk enough. Right. Yeah. You yeah. need to ask more questions. You're really good when you're not on the microphone at asking questions. Yeah. You have to think more about like. The questions that you want to know about because the listener want to know, wants to know about it too. Right. Yeah. It, it is a funny thing. Like I got lots of sisters and people and this is like consistently, it literally happened yesterday when I was talking to <laughs> not a sister, but a, a friend. And, uh, but my sister's are like, I love listening to Unpack. It's so good. I love the conversations that you have and everything. Yeah. And also, like, Tara asks the best <laughs> questions. Yeah. yeah and I'm like, oh. You're like, Tara spoke for two minutes. Thanks. And yeah. she stole the show. <laughs> yeah. What? What about all the other minutes? Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, we, we get along so well and, and we, we are a great team that yeah. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys have, like and I said, you balance so well. It's pretty fun. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. that's, I think that's lovely. And I think it also takes a pressure off when you have that partner sitting with you. Anytime that I was facilitating any kind of conversation with families and their young people, like in crisis at work, it was a joy to have a colleague next to me because you can't, you're trying to read the room. You're trying to, you also have your own energy you're bringing to the table that you're managing. And then sometimes you go back, I don't know about you, but like when I go back, I'm like, oh, I wish I had asked another question about that. But I only caught my angle of mm-hmm. the conversation, right? To have a, a co-host or a partner side by side, I think that's great. And like I said, sometimes it doesn't work well, but for with both of you, it's beautiful. You guys really have the seamless process. And I had even mentioned the last time when when we were trying to record, I'm like, Tara, because when you guys <laughs> interviewed me, I was so nervous. It's a different uh, position to be sitting in in comparison to hosting. Mm-hmm. I remember during the recording, I was like, man, Tara's like, is she thinking like I suck or like, this is before I got to know you, but too, like, <laughs> am I saying the wrong thing? Sometimes I'm so offensive. Like she doesn't really know me. And like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to be offensive. It just comes out like, just like really in my head a lot of the time. And I'd mentioned to you too, it felt like those panel interviews were the, the powerful one <laughs> pulls the move where they say nothing. Uh, and you know, you did ask some follow-up questions, but yeah. yeah. And then you both laughed when we met up the last time saying, yeah, that's something that you're trying to 
build on mm-hmm. and, and you recognize that. So yeah, having you come on today, yeah. it's been like this whole energy in the room has is very different. So I'm glad it worked yeah. out that we're in here together because I feel like I get to hear from you today. Yeah. 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 It is kind of like, first of all, she's not doing that for sure. No, like, I'm ever. not yeah. judging. Like, yeah. For also, real. It's like, that's not what's happening. That up. Thank yeah. you for closing that loop. <laughs> yes. Let's close that loop. Also, I learned that that was all me. Sorry. Yeah. I just like leave oh, Tara. Just, Everyone's like, who I is this? to be quiet. I'm like, we'll <laughs> see. Just, yeah, staring away all judgmentally. Also, the other thing yeah, that's really also, funny. Also, yeah. Let's just say that none of that was accurate. That was all my anxiety. <laughs> Which is fair. It's yeah, totally we bring fair. Our, we bring our own story to every conversation. Well, <laughs> right but we also have to recognize that it's perception and perception is not fact yeah right yeah. like that was that was my energy and and my nerve nerves and all that and it just takes a simple the next time we see each other bringing it up lightly is a joke and also getting that clarification yeah. like because you're like oh my gosh i don't want you feeling like that was yeah. not at all what was happening yeah, yeah. so i'm glad we clarified I, that i will yeah. say this though you're not the super call. villain yeah she's not the super villain yeah. that's sitting there. <laughs> although that's a cool she, title to she have. may be I mean, the mastermind that's oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah yeah that i yeah. might agree to <laughs> but the other funny thing is she sits so still in a zoom call like oh. we sit together on a couch yeah. while we while we do a Zoom call, right. and she does not move. Oh wow! <laughs> and I am a twitcher. I, yeah, I'm legitimately like yeah. always in motion. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes it even worse because yeah. I'm moving around. My <laughs> arms are waving around in the air. Yeah. She's just like. Game. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's, we otherwise we think the call was frozen. If exactly. you were moving around, if it around. wasn't for me, you would. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Anyways, awesome. yeah, that's no. how we started out yeah. though. We, we kind of started out and we were working at a church at yeah. the time. And so a lot of our topics and the things that we were doing were around yeah. mental health, you know, personal growth and development, like yeah. those kinds of things. And, and, and then a huge emphasis on story Yeah, mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. I've always been, I've been convinced in the 30 years of being a, a pastor that story is really kind of where it's at. Mm. It's where you grow from. It's the only evidence that you even existed. Right. It's your past experiences and all those kind of things. So when we kicked off the podcast, it was really like, okay, we want to talk to smart people. Yeah. Yeah. That have all kinds of experience in this. Right. But we would really like to hear the story of why they, mm-hmm. why did, why did they care about what yeah. they do and yeah. some of those things and, and then recognizing that, Stories are messy. Mm-hmm. Like you have to be good with it. You have to be okay with kind of go, yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Or that's not good. And, you know, that's hard yeah. or that's whatever. And, and they change too. They change. Along the way. All the time. Oh, the ending's you... not what you thought it was yeah. going to be. Oh. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. Speaking of that, here we are a year later. <laughs> exactly. Anyways, but that's kind of how we started the podcast. It yeah. was really around like the messiness of story yeah. and storytelling. And that's really yeah. the space and it's the it's sometimes the messy places in our life, uh, spaces and places, so to speak, mm-hmm. where we grow and, and are shaped and transformed and all those kinds of things. And and uh and we were also working in a context that to be completely honest with you, isn't really great. Mm, what do you mean? Uh messy spaces. Mm. I, I just think, you know. And I, I'm I'm not out to attack the church or any sort of way like yeah. that, but I but I would say that the uncomfortableness of messiness and uncleanliness, yeah. I'm not sure how else to word yeah, it, no. sometimes it freaks people out. That's they don't right. know what to do with it. And uh and so it they respond poorly. They mm-hmm. they they I think a lot of people have come to understand that somehow a faith and, and I think this is true of most religions, mm-hmm. so it's not just the one I was a part of. Right. Um, is very much about obediently making, you know, behaving well so God will, you know, reciprocate that. So that you, whether that's a prosperous life or that's a whatever. Right. And um, I'm not so sure hmm. that any of it is actually about that. But I would definitely say that when we started the podcast and started really asking people real questions and being w- willing to sit with people in the, in, in the difficulty of their answer yeah, without trying to fix it. Right. Which is kind of what my middle fingers up is actually about. Oh, sh- just wait, we're going to get there. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> no ask me again, I, I won't, I'll try not to forget. Yeah. There's an unease with that. And, it, and, it, and, and I think tr- tr- 
truth telling is like that. I yeah. think there's an unease to hearing truth. Oh, for sure. It hurts for sure. Yeah. Especially if you're the one that's coming out of your mouth yeah. and yeah. you're, you're now going to expose something about yourself or something that people saw in a different way. Yeah. And the, the thing about it is too, though, that when you do tell the truth, people are still going to decide to see it how they want mm -hmm. just because I'm telling you my truth or being honest about this topic or this conversation you might still walk away deciding, well, that's she doesn't have it quite right, mm -hmm. or she doesn't know, yeah. or poor Kieran, she's you know yeah. hurt and and yeah. whatever, right? Or they're so, jaded. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, that, yeah. That word got used with this towards weekend. me on that the weekend. You were jaded. Oh my yes. god! I was oh, like, holy weekend. shit! I've heard that word in a while. I, I yeah. it was uh, yeah, it wasn't great. Well, yeah. But. Wow. Okay. Well, I can't wait to. I feel like this is going to be part of your middle fingers up. Well, maybe partially. Maybe fueled, it should fueled be. By. Yeah, maybe <laughs> it should be. No, I think. And what was interesting in it is now, like as we've grown, and so what ended up happening is a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of years ago. A last year. year ago. <laughs> a year Feels ago. like it, right? Uh, yeah. COVID. Take a year. Leave a yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, I'm Enneagram Seven, so in my past, uh, any painful things in the past, I would prefer to leave there. Ah. I find it very hard. There we go. To do painful things. Yes. Uh, sad things in particular. So I, I moved past them really quickly. So I, ah. it feels like as it was laughs. years ago already. Yeah. yeah. As I laugh. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. a seven. But when we, uh, when I decided to leave and move on, mm -hmm. uh, I asked for the rights to the podcast mm. and uh, they weren't going to do anything with it. it. You know, really the host. You know, it was so much of it was centered around so much of unpacked is centered around the personalities that were present. Right. At the time, we didn't know Tara didn't know what she was going to do. Um, but I just asked for it because I was like, I don't know if I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. But I love it. Yeah. And they gave me the rights. And that what's been interesting, if you if you're a, a faithful listener of unpacked, you start to hear and see there is a there is a very clear just shift mm -hmm. that takes place. Uh, in the topics and the conversations that we have, mm -hmm. even the way that I speak about from things. when you were part of the church yeah. to a after, yeah. hey, yeah, interesting. It's subtle. Like I would say, it's subtle, but it's also but you felt it. Oh yeah, no, we both did. There's a we have less of a filter. Yeah, you definitely hear me swear more. Yeah, <laughs> we, like yeah, we swear more. We also the people we can have on feels yeah. different too. Mm -hmm. Like there's just some topics that felt like oh we could you know church people are going to be not like this. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. not going to like, and they already were struggling a little bit with what we were doing. Like right. there was already some discomfort around it. I think good discomfort, but also some people were like, yeah, no, I'm not going to listen to them totally. talk like that or whatever. Yeah. And then yeah, so. Growth, growth is uncomfortable. It's yeah. so uncomfortable. We were fine with it, but it was definitely, we were hearing feedback. And then as we were no longer with the church and continued yeah. to do it, yeah, we could. So can explore. I ask, because I have so many questions I want to unpack with you now. Ask away. <laughs> so did you ever, was there ever a time in your life that you would have thought you would leave your church? Like, was that a surprise to you when that, process, when that happened? Because you were a pastor for 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, there's got to be some, I don't know, I'm just projecting my own stuff out here, but like, I would imagine some grief and loss and quite oh, yeah. a confusing, yeah. messy, yeah. as you said, maybe process. Uh -huh. It has been. I'm not trying to make this like a therapy session because no, I am not a therapist, the but, away, the but like, away. you know, I'm just curious because there's yeah. a story there as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. There is. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Do you want to tell your, your part first? Sure. Yeah. I can share a little bit of mine. So I didn't grow up in the church at all. I went to church growing up on and off with yeah. my family, but I didn't – like I always had a faith, but I honestly frequently struggled with some of the structures around the church and the rules. And I just couldn't imagine as a young child being like, why would certain people not be allowed? My uncle is gay. And so that was one of the things I had. I also was told often when I was younger by religious people that because I wasn't baptized, I wouldn't go to heaven. Yeah. So there were some like things like that where I was like, no – I don't think that's what God would want. Mm -hmm. And I had good parents who said those kind of things to me too. Mm -hmm. And then when Ryan and I were getting married, we met, uh, we reconnected with Evan and he did our wedding. And then we started going to this church and we had been going to this church for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, and serving in it. And then eventually I obviously started working there alongside Evan. We had really just great chemistry, as you said, and also loved working together. Yeah. So it was really something we were highly invested in. And yeah, as the as kind of things evolved, we were able at our church to create an environment and be. A, I was able to be a part of this environment too that was actually accepting. So from day one, there were gay people at our church. Right. And that was a big deal to me. Yeah. So, and the way that I've been pastored and the way that the church, the values of the church just aligned with us. It was about 
not just the four walls and keeping people in and out, but yeah. being in the community, making it a better place. So all those things were really something that I could align with and the God that I believed in. Mm -hmm. And my faith grew and I got to be around people and explore all these like wonderful things and, and learn so much. And then as kind of time went on, our denomination wasn't really moving forward on changing any of the rules mm -hmm. around pastors specifically marrying people in the LGBTQ plus community. It was interesting because they could like serve, they could be a part, like, it was like, you can be here, yeah, but we yeah. won't marry you. Interesting. And it, I kind of always had hope for this denomination because they were quite progressive and yeah. I understood some of the history working there and our community itself just felt really like, oh yeah, this will be something we eventually get to. Mm -hmm. And things kind of shifted in the pandemic and it became more and more clear that that wasn't going to be the values. So that became really difficult for me also being an adoptive mom of a black child. Mm -hmm. I am noticing how much I pay attention to the marginalized groups in the mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking like, well, if you're not going to care for one, how do you care for the other ones? Mm. And what is he going to see in this environment? And yes, we have some control over it right now, but what is he watching? What is he going to grow up in? How are people going to interact? And there was a definite shift yeah. of like, oh, this may not be there were people that I was even surprised by some of the things that were coming out of their mouth yeah. around this community and their lack of willingness to stand beside them mm. that my husband and I just eventually were like, I don't think we can be here. And it became quite clear, obviously, when Evan and we were talking behind the scenes about trying to, you know, talk about this in the denomination context and how would this look in our community and how would we move this conversation forward mm -hmm. being communications, that would be something I would help do. And I, and it wasn't happening. Yeah. And that was really, really disappointing, especially with some key leaders. And then, yeah, when Evan decided to move on, my husband and I were like, what do we do here? Like, do we want to continue being here? I, I was trying to figure out my role mm -hmm. and my role in the community yeah. of like, do I continue to be here or do I continue to work here? Two different things, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I had decided to set down my job and no longer wanted to be in that role. But I wasn't sure what to do about the community. And we had asked some questions behind the scenes to see some of what the leaders were thinking. And it became quite clear that it wasn't mm -hmm. going to be this safe place anymore. So we had to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And do you do you look back and like how do you feel about that decision looking back now? Well, there was a lot of peace in it, to be honest. Yeah. Like it felt like the right thing. Like I was just like, well, if I I just can't imagine being a part of a place anymore that is like, well, Jesus loves everybody except for. Yeah, but except for these times right. of the day. And that just didn't hour. make sense yeah. to me. And the yeah. the lack of willingness to stand up for something yeah. and people you care about, yeah. I just like, I can't handle. Yeah. So I, there was a lot of anger, but I also a lot of grief. Like, yeah. you know, we, we lost a community too. We, that, we yes. chose to leave a community that we loved and served in. Mm -hmm. And then it does leave you in kind of this weird place where we still live there too. Right. It, yeah. So, it's a small community. Yeah. So you're, you're going to see each other and just yeah. or wherever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And people assumed that we no, didn't return because we took a little bit of a break. We were both serving and people assume we didn't return because of Evan. They just associated me with Evan. Yeah. So yeah. that was also. Gave him all the power. Yeah. 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 Like I, we left because of him and his wife, yeah. obviously, who was also a good friend of mine. And yeah, obviously it was yeah, them. Yeah, that's right. You didn't make your own decisions. <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, even when we ask questions. You'll find your and, way back. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah, so it's been sad that way, but we do have a, like a, our pod of people are all very close and we do have our own community and we still are people of faith and yeah. that hasn't changed. So I've been able, we've been able to grieve and be a part of that together, yeah. which right. I'm really, really grateful for, but it's been sad and messy and yeah. a big change. Can I ask like, why do you, we're going to, you're going to share your piece here too, Evan, but like before we do that, why do you think for people that belong to a church or again, temple that believe in their religion, why do you think it's, hard to separate what happens outside those four walls that there's more to it like you said like why, why do you think it's got to be this way and this is the way it is like what gets in the way of yeah jesus jesus loves all except for like where does that accept come from that I don't really know a lot about. I can make an assumption. You've been observing yeah. <laughs> church people your whole life, so I don't know, really. But... That, was a, that was a kind way of saying, listen, I, I'm I, not going there, Kieran. <laughs> now I got to talk. I'm yeah. like, oh, no, no, You're I like, got please, something to say about I? that. Yeah. Sure. yeah, you do. I would have less to say about that because it's just – Is I, that a fair question? Maybe that's not a no. fair question No, it's either. a fair, it's a fair just... question. I just sometimes feel like I've been on the outside of it and I've kept my foot Because outside. you didn't – that's not – Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it feels You're like, like – a... Tell me too, Evan. I want to know as well. Well, 
yeah. used to talk like this all the time because this is how I learned how to work at a church because yeah. I didn't know. I was like, what? Oh, people are offended by what? Yeah. Like I was the person asking what you're asking. So, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I actually – a lot of – a lot of even what Tara was saying was we had a lot of conversations like that where I was like, well, no, this is how they're seeing it. Mm -hmm. This is how they're hearing yeah. this particular message. And this is, and she was in communication. So she was constantly asking me, well, we're just going to put this up. And I was like, well, we are, we need to say it, but mm -hmm. we need to figure out how they're going to hear it. Yeah. So here's what I would say. I think that, um, I'll try to make this fast. Cause I, I love the question. Actually. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. Absolutely okay. love the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that um, every religion starts out of a desire to, to love others and to change their community that they live in. So every grassroots organization, even if it's a nonprofit, is starting out and setting out to do a particular thing in the context in which they live. Yeah. So whether that's religion or, or whatever, it, it it's, should be about that. And that's how it grows. Mm -hmm. And I do think that once when something like that grows, whether it's a church or, or anything else, there is a sense where those who, who are part of that yeah. begin to grow a real sense of belonging and because they're kind of in it together, so to speak. Right. And this, this is going to sound negative. Maybe, maybe the jaded part is about oh, to come up. I don't know. Here we but go. <laughs> but I, I think that what, what ends up happening is that group of people wants to keep that safe. They want to keep it. They don't want to lose any part of it. Yeah. And so they begin to say, okay, well, what are the, what are the touchstones of this thing, this grassroots thing that we've started? Mm -hmm. And, and so you begin to write and, and articulate those things down. And when you do that, you're of course writing down the good things about this is what we're going to be about. Yeah. But I think you're also unconsciously writing the things that you're not going to be about oh. at the same time that's taking place. And so you have this deep sense of belonging. It drives you to institutionalize kind of what you're doing mm -hmm. and and then all of a sudden you find yourself in trouble because institutions are designed to protect themselves mm -hmm. and so the freedom that comes in a grassroots organization whether that's we love jesus and love neighbor so we're going to do this thing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, at all costs we're going to love our neighbors mm -hmm. at all costs and it doesn't matter if they're gay mm -hmm. or they're straight or they're, they're or they're muslim or they're mm -hmm agnostics or they're whatever mm -hmm. atheists whatever whatever it doesn't matter or douchebags or douche yeah they're still <laughs> even if they're a douche yeah. you know yeah. it, it, it is an interesting thing because i used to say this you know i'm in part of the christian community so i'll just use that as the contents but I, as we started out the church that we were a part of i used to say look we're a bunch of us are moving to town if you move to town in your cul-de-sac your that cul-de-sac should suddenly be a safer place for everybody to live it should be a more caring place it should be a more fun it should be more fun Mm -hmm. It should be, you get this, less judgmental, mm -hmm. according to what we believe Jesus would say, mm -hmm. less judgmental. It's fascinating, right? Yeah. And yet, none of those yeah. things would be really yeah. the words you would use to describe yeah. a church, would they? Right? Yeah, like, I'm going to be honest, no. <laughs> yeah, of right? course not. And, no. and so that's, the, that's what ends up happening is you institutionalize it. Yeah. And this is what I would say. I wrote it down on a piece just when Tara was talking. Oh, look it's at like you being so polite, not interrupting. A, a strong sense of belonging. Yeah. You have this sense of belonging in this community. That sense of belonging drives you to formalize it, institutionalize it. And then all of a sudden, as soon as you do that, anything that's outside coming in becomes a threat. But even if that, that is about growth, because... If I have a sense of belonging in a community, I'm still as an individual, am I not growing? Am I not recognizing that something that I believe five years ago served me, supported me, but today because of this near life, ex death, whatever experience or whatever experience I had with this person I met, it's ch is it because it's challenging it and then we become fearful, yeah, fearful of that? Yeah, fearful. That's 100%. It, and I we think. like certainty. Yeah. 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 Like... I, th I think that's one of those interesting things is that, and you know, we've did a re an episode today got yeah. released in our shoulder to shoulder series yes, about like, about what, shoulder shoulder what do we talk about? Like, do we, is faith about like trusting that there is a mystical God that's out there, a creator that's out there, or is faith about certainty? Because mm -hmm. faith and certainty are not the same things. Mm. But I would say that the Christian community is very set on certainty. No, I want to know what mm -hmm. my my God mm -hmm. requires of me so I can do those things so that he'll love me. Oh, wow. And, I, and I, I just think, <laughs> I think that's one of the realities of what kind of what happens is that is that people start going, but they do not recognize that they have fear. Mm 
Yeah. That fear is actually a driving core motivation of what's happening. And as soon as like, this has been my observation when fear has taken over in my life, I'm no longer curious. Mm -hmm. I can't, I cannot engage curiosity. Mm -hmm. I can't engage the possibility that I might be wrong. Mm. I can't engage the possibility that there might be a better way. I can't get like, I can't yeah. do any of it. It's fucking lost. Yeah, you're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You know? And I would say that that's the, that's the, that's the problem. But and this, so you start protecting your sense of belonging. But okay. Now my question's back to what you were saying. Okay. But then if I believe and you know, in my God and whatever faith I am, then how come I'm still walking outside and not loving my neighbor and still telling them that they're an idiot or they need to cut their grass or whatever it is that they, you know, want, want to say, like, I find then there's, we're contradicting ourselves because if, you know, fine, I'm not going to grow. I want certainty, but in that certainty, we also talk about loving and being respectful. So is it, it's choice then? Like, you know, like mm -hmm. I can pick and choose, like, I'll respect you, Tara, because I like the sweater you're wearing today, but uh, not you, Evan, because you you're like plaid. No, yeah, yeah. Clear, not, not, no, right? Like, so like, <laughs> I know I'm making it sound like I definitely don't want to make it make this conversation be offensive to anyone listening as well as both of you in the room. Well, let's, let's offend. Uh, uh, but <laughs> however, I just feel it's so cool having you both in the room because you talk very fluid. You talk very open outside of four walls mm -hmm. and i think that is really really refreshing to hear because i i sometimes struggle with friends and family and colleagues in the community and society when we get boxed into that you know your certainty is now my failure like i've done something wrong to you because I'm the neighbor that looks this way or whatever and it's like we can't have it both ways yeah and you don't get to go to your your temple or your church and pray to your God and say, I'm a good person. When five minutes ago, you, you made me feel like you, you're actually not because you judge me for this thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, where's the, where's the, we talk about forgiveness and these beliefs, but I just see so many of my own community members being shackled to some of these, what I think could be wonderful beliefs. H however, we're shackled because there's no room for growth or, but we're looking for a belonging and I sometimes look at my community members and I think, what, where is that belonging now for you when you're suffering in silence? Because you think this is what God wants. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. wants you to do this. And I like what you said, Tara, which is God wouldn't, God wouldn't want that for, for me. Like yeah. God wouldn't want that for this person next year. So I just, I, I sometimes get feedback from people on this show that have actually left their church mm -hmm. or their their beliefs. You know, I had a comedian on that was Sikh and went to a Khalsa school out in Surrey, grew up with it ha and questioned a lot of how that was taught. I've had people with, in, with other beliefs come on or email separately and say, yeah, like because of how it went for me, um, because how they felt it was shoved down their throat, they're so far removed from yeah. it now. And some of them are like on the other other end of the spectrum where they're like, there actually is yeah. no God. Like, I don't, I don't believe in any of that. And so I think sometimes these certainties cause so much pain for, for so many people. I got a few things to say about that. First of all, I'm sorry that that's happened to you, that you feel that way and, <laughs> and have experienced that. And I have too. I, I can, I can definitely feel that. And I would actually put myself right now in a category that's similar to what you just said about some of your previous guests. So you got, you got a few more here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I would say though. I think, and, and maybe this is going back a couple of minutes to what you said that kind of sparked something in me is like, I, I always taught as a pastor and always believed as a pastor that my, that my God and my church were not the same, mm -hmm. that, that your religion and your God are not the same. In other words, it's like your religion is the system that you've come up with to know your God. Yeah. But it's not your God. So, so I do think that end, what ends up happening is that people in the context of faith communities yeah. start picking up what is actually probably more closer to the traditions yeah. of their faith than their actual faith. Yeah. And those things become rules and they become... Not, they start out as gentle ways yeah, of like, yeah, here's yeah. how you're going to. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they become so far apart yeah. from the heart of God 
that, that they will no longer look the same. And it's funny, I had a That's chance. That's very well said. I just mm-hmm. want to say really well said. Yeah, I, I had a chance. This is a funny story and I tell a lot, so I should be careful. I'll try to do it fast. <laughs> I got to go to Israel a few times. I've been to Israel a couple of times. Both times I got to spend time in, in Israel, Palestine. Okay. And I actually spent more time in Palestine kind of understanding, trying to figure out the conflict. Because it was really easy to figure out that conflict. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> said no one ever. <laughs> I remember asking this really smart guy. He is the uh, academic dean at, uh, at Bethlehem Christian University. And I said, what's, how do you solve, what's the solution mm-hmm. to this issue mm-hmm. that's going on? And he kind of laughed at me. He's a really funny guy. Kind of laughed at me. And he goes, look, I live in a land of agendas. Mm-hmm. It's like every major religion. And most small religions are represented here in this on the land that I walk on. And I think this is going to sound really simplistic, but he's like, if we could stop trying to defend what we believe is the agenda of God mm-hmm. and start living out the heart of God, hmm. the problem will be solved. Mm-hmm. Because we pick up agendas, right? We think, well, this is what my God wants. Yeah. This is what my God requires and again, expects and like all of those it's things. It's so subjective. Yeah. yeah. Because it's also written in our sacred texts in a way to be interpreted by so many different, oh, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Mine. So in my household, my agenda is this way, but in your household, your gen- so our agendas aren't, even though we're trying to serve the same beliefs, our Things are different. Tradition is different. Hundred percent. Right? Like tradition is different. To- totally. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's a genius. That person. That man. No, is he a was genius. super smart. Like, never forgot. Well it. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, it like, was one of those sit there with your mouth open. Yeah, you're like, like, well, yeah. Heart of God over agenda. Yeah. Over my belief, my understanding of God's agenda. Yeah. And then what you start realizing when you start leaning into the heart of God, wh- yeah. whatever that, whatever, whichever God it is that you you refer to, that that you hear when you hear that, it's like. And you go, yeah, my religion and my God are not measuring up. Yeah. My religion is telling me to love my neighbor, Mm -hmm. but actually I'm the asshole on the street. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's not in connection with the heart of my God. Yeah. And then you got a problem. That takes so much self-awareness. No. (laughs) Right. Whether we, whether we, whether we have a religion or a God or not there, regardless, Mm -hmm. their self-awareness is its own category of yeah yeah, recognizing okay how can i how how can i you know sometimes you do these tests like personality and leadership (laughs) tests at work right oh you're setting me up for the yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. and it's like you know you fill these forms out and sometimes you're like okay who wrote this because it's like when you're at work can you trust your colleagues if I'm if I'm having a shitty day, I'm gonna say no because you know I'm better. I do or my which job. Which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Which yeah, one? yeah, yeah, I trust exactly. Some of them. Right? <laughs> do, do and it's always about the external. It's mm-hmm. do these people do these things? And sometimes you know, like when I was in leadership, we'd have to flip it and help the people that I would oversee, including myself, recognize. Okay, how would I answer that question if it was, can my colleagues trust me? Mm-hmm. That's a very different answer, right? I'm going to be sitting there for a long time wondering. It's easier to write, no, I can't trust you, but can you trust me? And I I really like that flip because that is self-awareness. That's how, what what do I have choice over? What can I be in charge of? Because there's a lot that I can't be in control of. And, and what do I do to make you trust me? If I put my energy towards that, maybe we'll actually be able to work together versus mm-hmm. ex- waiting on you, which I can't control you. I don't even know how I got to the personality test, but I know where it's going to bring me next. I want to learn about the Enneagram because we talked about this at the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. So, and you mentioned you were a seven earlier and people are probably like, what, what, what does, that mean? <laughs> what does yeah. that mean? Like you're literally the number seven. Who is this person? So we're going to go there. We're going to like go Like out there. of 10, I'm a seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like giving himself <laughs> yeah. his own Yelp yeah. reviews yeah. right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm over 50%, but I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. Top, yeah not, don't put high expectations. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three and a half star out of five. That's perfect. right. That's seven for yeah, sure. yeah, there's room for improvement. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and you know what? Before we jump into that, I do have to say that it's like what what was fascinating for me as a pastor, because I 
my story is completely different than Tara's in terms of. Did we get? We didn't even talk about no, your story. No. We do this. I do this. That's so okay. thank okay. you for. There's th- uh, it takes three. How many? How many podcasters does it take to do an episode? <laughs> I hundred percent usually just like move on, but I would say you? I would say what is interesting about it is that I grew up in the church, and I grew up in the denomination that I served for thirty years. Very opposite mm-hmm. from you, Tara. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so so my everything about me is rooted in this particular faith, this particular denomination, yeah. all of it, right? So my parents still attend this particular denomination. I have I have a sibling who's a, still a pastor in mm. that denomination. Yeah. So, and, and I don't think it's, I actually think this denomination has tried really hard to do a lot of very, very good things. Right. So over LGBTQ plus inclusion, I think they believe they are doing a good job and still holding on to what they Think of the, the scriptures say. Right. I happen to disagree now. Now. Mm. And I think that's part of, you know, if I was to say the story part is that it's like 30 years of pastoring. I planted the church that, we, that Tara mm-hmm. was talking about. I was the planter. I started it. Yeah. So understand the grassroots be start of, of kind of what that looked like. And I think what is really fascinating is that what what happens if if growing and being as a human – if God wants us to grow as humans, period, I actually believe that. I think we're made for growth. Mm-hmm. Your whole body is growing mm-hmm. con- right. yeah. physically. It's growing mm-hmm. constantly. What happens when the that safe organization starts to feel an instability because their leader mm-hmm. is growing outside of their comfort zone? Mm-hmm. And so I think that what ends up happening is so many leaders, pastors, and we're finding this, we are hundred mm-hmm. percent hearing this. What happens when the leader starts to grow outside of the comfortability of those that they serve and say, hello, oh, because what ends up happening is most pastors end up doing all of that. This is going to sound really connected, but it's like, they almost have to take their actual beliefs into the closet mm. and hide and not say, Mm -hmm. and not communicate. Actually, I don't think that's the heart of God. I think that's the tradition of the Mm -hmm. church. I think that, right? Is that what happened for you? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it sure was. Yeah, to like lock it up, hey? Yeah, and 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 I think for a while it was. Yeah, yeah, not the whole time. You you were just doing it on more of an individual basis to talk to people more directly. And I I, I do think that then what what ends up happening is you you start moving your actual beliefs into a secret lonely place, which isn't always terrible for a period of time, but then it just actually becomes lonely. Yeah. And it starts to feel more like shame than it does to feel like growth. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you hear all of the other things that are kind of coming at you Mm -hmm. and, and we'll get to the Enneagram part of kind of how I had to operate in that. Cause I often, you will use my own stories as examples because it's not fair to use others other than the terror. I pick on (laughs) terror, but but then all of a sudden you come to a space where you're like, I am leading an organization now Mm -hmm. that no longer actually is willing to even hear me speak what, what, growth and transformation i am experiencing it's no longer safe for me yeah it's no longer safe for in my case for my family mm-hmm. it's no longer safe for my wife who's more progressive than i am mm-hmm. she, she she she's grown much faster in so many areas of her of her ability to actually see what the church really look right. looks like and i'm not just talking about individual church the church as a whole big c is what i'm talking about right and she would say, she would be honest about that and just get hammered mm. over it. Mm. And then you start seeing, I, I hate to say it, but the pandemic produced and showed us the true colors of so many fears and anxieties mm. inside the context of religious groups. Yeah. And so whether that was around LGBTQ plus or Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. or like all, mm-hmm. all of these so things. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're just, it just became very painful to realize, and I was at hockey one night. This is my funny story. I was at hockey one night during the pandemic, and my defensive partner, who I love, man, this guy is—we've just become good friends. Yeah. And uh, we're at warm up, just about to start, and he's like, "How are you doing?" I was like, oh, "I'm okay." And he's like, "Actually, I've been meaning to ask you, like, what's it like to like be leading the most 
crazy group of people in the world right now. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> I was like, question. Oh my God. And <laughs> like, I, what are you supposed to say to that? I, you know what I said? I was like, well, actually, they've always been crazy. <laughs> people are just finding out now. <laughs> How crazy, right? And it was, it was kind of like one of those. Right, like, yeah. I always try to respond with humor and that yeah. was kind of exactly how I did it. But it was, it was true. It was like, no, we aren't actually responding in so many ways. The church did not respond mm -hmm. in connection with the heart of God. Mm -hmm. So they start talking about freedom and they're using Jesus as like, mm -hmm. as like the figurehead of freedom. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that has had nothing to do yeah. with what real freedom looks like. Yeah. And they had no idea who they were marginalizing in their conversation about freedom and then using God as some right. backup for yeah. it. Well, that, that's that, going to that sound offensive. In, no, but, but it, that it, carried into households, right? It, like, it did. You had a lot of family members not willing to see other family members. And yeah, like the pandemic was right up there with religion and politics. Mm -hmm. The three mm -hmm. things you just don't go into at a... At a mm -hmm safe outdoor gathering yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, right because again fear of my belief and your belief clashing yeah we can't be in the room and have two very different beliefs and still socialize like yeah. we did there's just no way of doing that yeah. so yeah like i think i think definitely religion and god sort of got a lot out of that sort of the government um but whether you you brought god to your daily conversations or not so many of us thought we were better mm -hmm. than the other yeah. because yeah. i did this this way and you're not doing it the right way that that was a conversation everywhere yeah, right and then yeah. many of us had to kind of walk back with our tails between our legs and sort of backpedal later as you as you learn more throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic about yeah. all sorts of other things as well as hey, what I decide to do is what we decide to do and I'm not going to mm -hmm. love you any less because mm -hmm. you have to make the good and right decision for what's happening in your life, in your household, in your health. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's how it's got to be. But yeah, the the war in between there, right? And it was just an example. I think we learn a lot about people in crisis. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and we, when we're all in a crisis at the same time, including the leaders that we're relying on, whether it be pastors like yourself or the healthcare system or our mm -hmm. parents, whoever, yeah, you look to them and you're like, holy crap. It, it, it literally is like the apocalypse. Everyone's running around trying to figure out what yeah. to do. Yeah. And now what are we going to do? Yeah. In times of uncertainty, you search for certainty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you do. Yeah. You know, so yeah. so I, I think that's what ended up happening was ultimately my theology changed. Yeah. I took it into the closet for so a while. So it was during the, the mm -hmm. pandemic was what no, the, was no, the catalyst no, for you? No. no. What, what the catalyst for me was... I believe that being inside the room was the way to create change. Yeah. But at, at some point, being inside the room, so to speak, you you have to recognize that you're not actually going to create change. Actually, these people have said what they believe. Mm -hmm. So now you're just complacent to that. Mm -hmm. Now you actually, by staying in the room, you are agreeing with what the room is saying. Mm -hmm. And I simply couldn't. I, I just couldn't do it. My daughter is is pansexual. She had had been telling us that. That's part of our series that's kind of that, you know, we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. I suddenly came to a place where I was theologically going, no, actually, I don't know that the Bible does say that LGBTQ plus people are going to hell. I don't actually know that it does say mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be able to be married. Mm -hmm. And and one of the conversations was like, well, we believe in the institution of marriage. And that, you know, the religious mm -hmm. community will often women. say, we believe yeah. in that, right? Mm -hmm. Except we don't ask any significant questions when we're going to marry somebody. It's just as long as one's a man and one's a woman, mm -hmm. and they and preferably the enough. same race. Too. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. Like, right? Right? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> we started saying we believe in the institution of marriage. Yeah. Except as long as yeah. Except there's that yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Tricky exactly word. right. Yeah. It's like so, but our pastors can't do this, and they can't do that, and they yeah. can't do. In my case, they can't do the things that they feel strongly a strong conviction for, even in in, in in around this. Right. And so honestly, what ended up happening was I started realizing if my daughter came to me and said, Dad, I want to get married and I would really like you to do the ceremony, I'll lose my job over that. Mm -hmm. And when I started realizing, oh, I would definitely lose my job over over if my daughter asked me that. Well, I'm here to serve people. Mm -hmm. This is the this was the call on my life was to serve people. So if I'm willing to do that for my daughter, mm -hmm. why wouldn't I do that for yours? Like, where's mm -hmm. the conviction in that? Yeah. 
that's not a conviction of what I believe. It's only a conviction that I'm going to love my daughter, mm -hmm. not yours. Yeah. And I, there just came too many points of conflict for me where I was like, no, I, I cannot do that. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I did I try. I really tried actually to talk to my leaders about this is where I'm at. This is what's going on. And it, it didn't, it didn't progress along the way that it, it really needed to for yeah. me. And then in the meantime, I ended up getting quite hurt and so did some others. And I think that that's the, that's the hard part. And, and finally it, it just, I just realized, well, I can't, by being in this room, yeah. I'm saying that this is okay. This harm that's being caused. And I simply wasn't okay with mm -hmm. it. So I had to move on. And so that's a little bit of how that worked out for me. And I think that's true of so many pastors and other leaders and other organizations and in other spaces and places too. And, and, uh, you know, that, that does mean forging out into kind of no man's liminal space as I talk about it in growth and transformation. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's the space that is in between the place you are and the place that you're going. Yeah. Except we don't always know the place we're going when yeah. it comes to growth and transformation. So we find ourselves in liminal space and, and I think I'm still in that. I, I mm -hmm. I'm growing and finding my legs. I think Tara mm -hmm. is too. I yeah. think, I think all of us are actually after the pandemic kind of finding our way still. And so mm -hmm. there's yeah. this growth and like being self-aware and, and yeah. some of those things becomes right. actually even more important yeah. to go, well, how are my fears influencing the decisions I make or the actions or behaviors that I have? Yeah. How is my shame doing that? How is my, you know, mm -hmm. my anger, what is my anger telling me? Yeah. You yeah, know, like yeah. all those kinds of things. Totally. And, yeah. And I was already studying Enneagram and the Enneagram as a growth tool. We used it a lot. A lot. At work yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so there was kind of a, a part of natural progression for me to go, no, I still love caring for people. I still love. Uh, and Tara is in the same. We talk about the Enneagram all I know. the time. I know. Yeah. When we <laughs> were, and not just on the podcast. Uh, well, and I when we were recording last time, that was my question. I was like, what is this? Like, tell me yeah. about this. So, but before <laughs> oh, we yeah. before we start, can I, can I go back and can we do our middle fingers up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I also want to thank you both before we do that. Just like, I really appreciated the, just the genuineness behind your, your experience and the story that led to where you are today. And, and for, for yourself, I've been talking about being in that, in that room, figuring out. And I, I, there's so many things I think about that people are going to relate to is like, we always have a choice in whatever position we're in and, and kudos to you to be able to really sometimes standing up is hard when you're standing up alone and, and going for it and doing something like that because you thought of your family and you thought of, okay, how would I also want someone to receive me? Should, should this be where I'm at in life? And so I think that's, that's really both of you like really appreciate how you shared your story. And I, I appreciate you allowing me to ask some kooky questions as well, <laughs> because <laughs> that's how, like you said, that's how we move forward. Right. And so what do you want to put your middle fingers up to? Tara. Okay. Mine is like a pretty consistent one, but chronic illness. Like yes. I have an autoimmune disease and just so many days revolve around my – all my days revolve around how I feel every day and, and planning that and being like – last night I was editing late and I was like, ugh. And then we have this day and it's super fun. Yeah. And also I have my mother-in-law coming over later and I was like, oh, tomorrow's going to be rough. Yeah. Like it's going to be really rough and I can predict it and it yeah. – yeah. So middle fingers up to that. Yeah, it's middle fingers annoying. up to that. It is fucking yeah. annoying. And I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. Yeah. Because that's, that's hard when you have to navigate – that dated it's like right there next to you constantly. yeah everything yeah, yeah everything it's it's a constant it's a constant calculation in my brain I'm used to it now I've had it for a long time so I am used to it but it yeah. is one of those things that it, you don't get to choose it and you don't get to choose when it flares up and you try really hard to do all the things right and yeah. then some days you just don't know you just yeah. wake up different every day with different pain so it's yeah. a yeah it's an annoying thing oh yeah well I'm glad you were able to come in today and make it oh yeah no yeah. I make it work like I know how to make it work and make my but week that's tiring too yeah like, yeah exhausting, right to like yeah. have to feel like you have to make it work yeah just planning like knowing the week and being like oh, okay so then this is gonna happen and this but if I do this so it's just yeah. a lot of thinking all the time but I I'm in a good system I know how to do it but it's annoying to have yeah yeah. Well, I think I'm going to add on what Tara just said yeah. for her. I'm not going to give you mine. Yet. I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, gonna... okay. You're going to make us wait. There's two things I, I observe. First of all, it's like what people don't realize is that if Tara gets sick, she stays sick. Mm -hmm. Like like months. So or even hospitalized. Like it gets, it gets a cold. She yeah. has a cold for like six weeks. Yeah. It's crazy. So it's like being 
And and then that that's the first thing I would say about it. So people don't realize that, and they don't realize it because she looks healthy. Yeah, she looks oh, yeah. just fine from the outside. Yeah, yeah from bubbly the outside, and right. happy yeah. and all those things. So yeah. she must be fine. She's not in pain. Yeah. And I do think that's just one of those things that's like, as her friend, yeah. I watch it and just go, oh, people don't realize. Yeah. They just think, well, she's just being paranoid or she's yeah. just whatever. Yeah, she's overdoing it. Yeah, no, you're always yeah. sick. What's that about? Yeah, or yeah. Like, whatever. It's just a cold. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Again. like maybe you should try exercise. Oh like, yeah, eating right. And yeah, some other <laughs> shit more that would make eat it... less. Yeah, is, exactly. You know what they yeah. tell you to lose weight and then yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Or you're not. You should go see a natural path. Right. Yeah. Yes, I've heard Have that. Have you a done lot. that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know a great one. Yeah. 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 And you're like, thanks, thank you. And I think that's the thing is when someone shares information like this something personal about whether it's i have an autoimmune thing i'm not feeling great i think yeah it's kind of like that space between that you talked about too and like we jump to not we don't want to be part of the the uncomfortableness we feel bad so we're we start making reasons and excuses and i have a couple of friends that drives me crazy they just want to fix it yeah have you tried this cream i'm like i don't fucking need a cream man (laughs) I just need you to hear that my butt sore today. Come on, you know. I don't you know just, why I said that, but that's so funny. Uh, but it, it's like we do this thing where sometimes it's like it's okay to let the yeah you have your yeah. you know what happens and you know how Lenny Levin is still laughing at the butt cream. <laughs> yeah. I was right past it. I was like, yeah. I'm with you. I know you were so focused. You're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still going. No, I, you just got real personal there for a second. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just, I, I, I just, yeah, sometimes I think it's a nice little reminder that when we share this stuff, we don't, you're not asking me to, you know, no, I don't you're need just it to saying solve, like, here's solved. where I'm at. And yeah. And let me yeah. just tell you that. Yeah. I think about these things. And I choose, like, sometimes I choose to share it or not share it. Yeah. Like, I don't need to share it all the time with all everybody in the world kind of thing. Like, I actually do like that you can't always tell <laughs> that right. I'm sick. So yeah. there is, some of it is nice because yeah. for a long time I actually did when I was symptomatic, I would slur. So mm. it was very obvious when I was sick early on and undiagnosed. So now there is an almost a freedom and a power in being able to separate it from myself too. Yeah. 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 And not having to bring it into everything. Right. And that's one thing I, I have to say I loved about the pandemic was that you could get sick too. Like, you know, you have sniffles and suck it up, princess, right. go to work. Yeah. and did that, yeah. Right. And then when we were like, you can't even come in for a sniffle, it was like such nice permission to mm-hmm. treat something. And then often for people that don't have autoimmune, it's like, yeah, you take a minute, you get the rest, you do what you got to do. It doesn't turn into something worse yeah. than, than what would happen is we all give everyone at the office or strep throat because my job's so important. I got to go in or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's, I've learned a lot about that taking a moment and being okay with when you are ill or mm-hmm. respecting because I learned a lot about my friend's autoimmune stuff as well during COVID was like oh yes like this is not just about me this is like when I come into work and say I'm fine and I have a cold I'm probably actually fine yeah you can function but the person next to me is yeah. not going to be so how do I think about others outside mm-hmm. of myself so i appreciate mm-hmm. i learned it's unfortunate it took a pandemic to learn yeah. that but and the, the, uh, the only other option <laughs> that the person next to you had is to not come to work yeah to lose their job yeah 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 you're not sick right? what do you do why are you at home yeah. could get in here yeah mm-hmm. right like and yeah i think that's absolutely true for tara even too it's like no she looks fine so yeah She'd yeah. be fine. Come She's to fine. work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, amount of times I was in the pandemic and doing like going to get like a you know vaccination or going to the doctors and they would be like, "Are you a healthcare worker?" <laughs> and I was like, "Nope, sick yeah. person. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm person. actually here. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually here for whatever you're giving." So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna play off of hers. Okay, uh, so I'll oh. give two middles. Well, so I give two middle fingers up. Like first this. is, yep. uh, so the first one's actually connected to Tara, and that is that... You're you giving know, your middle fingers up to no, Tara? No, not directed towards, <laughs> connected to. Okay. <laughs> when people say every everything happens for a reason, and we were actually talking yeah. about that on the way in, that it's like when people say to Tara, well, everything happens for a reason, you're like, fuck that. <laughs> what are you talking about? She has autoimmune disease yeah. for a reason. Yeah, that, yeah. That's what's happening here. So that's my first one. Because yeah. I needed to learn the lesson. Yeah, 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 yeah there's yeah. an important yeah. lesson here, Tara. Because you were the strong <laughs> one. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so I, my, my second one is when people it. use God to do it. Oh. And, uh, and uh, that actually is related to a story that I heard this weekend and I've had it used against me and all those kind of things. And it's like, I, I, I know somebody particularly who's lost uh, their job recently and things have been very, very difficult. And it's, and, and it's in the faith community. Hmm. And it's so fascinating to me because here's this person, they've lost their job. Somebody asks them how they're doing. They give an answer. 
And then the response. And I think it's because people don't know what to do with the, yeah. the actual truthful answer that they gave. Mm -hmm. They go, well, I can't help but wonder how that fits into God's plan. Mm -hmm. And I just go, no, God does not plan mm -hmm. for bad things to happen to you. That mm -hmm. is not a part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. That's something we came up with. So that we can feel better about bad shit that's yeah, going and turn it into going on positive, around us, right? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I don't actually yeah. find that yeah. in there. Yeah, you know. So, I, so to me, I I I think that's my like my those. second one. One is yeah. that everything happens for a reason, and then you add the mm -hmm. the, the like God that. factor on top yeah. and go. Really, yeah. did we see Jesus come and create harm? Right. Did we see him come and do harm? Right. Like on purpose? Right. No, we did not. So it can't yeah. be right. Anyways, yeah. there you go. I'm going to stop because I, I like get really no, get I like fired that. up. There you go. Yeah, you, you can get, I <laughs> my, got fired. We can all get fired up. showed up just yeah. now yeah. and started <laughs> healing somebody. Here. I like He's it. Turning I like, water, yeah. turn this water into wine here in a second. <laughs> well, well we can, it. yeah, we can do I'll that. I'll take a Pinot Grigio. <laughs> a, a skill I have tried and failed at every time, just to be honest with you. Keep trying, keep <laughs> trying. Keep trying. Don't give up on that. Yeah. Definitely not Jesus status yet. Oh man, Anyways. I love it. Oh my God, you're making my, I'm crying laughing here. <laughs> Those are good. I was going to share this last time when I was on with you guys and then we got canceled. I thought I'll keep it for today. It, my middle fingers are going up to this whole, like we're raising two boys and my 12 year old last Monday, he broke his arm. And so we went to emerge and to take care of him and all these sorts of things. And when we're sitting in the emergency room, uh, you know, he's like, I'm really... So the, the one thing about my 12 year old is when he breaks his arm for the second time, he's in a lot of pain, but he holds it. it I don't want to say this, but he holds it really well in that he doesn't show the pain. So he could mm -hmm. be at a nine, but it looks like he's at a four or five. So sometimes we don't even believe him. Poor guy. We're like, you're fine, but he's actually in a lot of pain, but he shows it like yeah. he's not. So we're sitting in a merge and he's handling it. And he's like, you know, I'm really proud of myself today. And I was like, oh yeah. He's like, I feel like I handled... Um, what happened really well. And it, it was like a series of things. Like he fell, jumped off the swings, fell onto his uh, wrist and then got up and then also like fell back and fainted because he was in a lot of pain. So he was like, I handled myself well. I'm like, oh, like, what are you proud about? And he's like, well, I didn't, I didn't uh, cry. Like, I feel like I did really good. I was strong. I didn't cry. So look, I'm sitting there now. I'm like, okay, this is that, this is this moment where I have an opportunity to do some re-scripting with like this toxic mm -hmm. masculinity thing, right? Like there's, there's something in me. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say, but I know I shouldn't be like, good for you. I'm glad you're, you didn't cry. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. But I also want to validate the fact that he's also saying that he's talking about self-reliance. He's talking about problem solving. He is talking about doing handling because he did have to take sort of take care of himself in a way. So there's that part I don't want to take from, but I'm like, ah, uh, like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. So I just kind of really didn't say a whole lot. Like I let there be some silence and, and I did, I did say like, I'm good, good for you to feel in the way that you do. And I did challenge a little bit. Do you think that crying would have been an issue? Like what, you know, he's like, no, no, I just feel like I'm really glad that I didn't and blah, blah. blah. So, you know, I thought, okay, like I'm going to let him have his proud moment because I shouldn't take that from him let that be, we'll get back to it. And then I talked to my husband, we got home, like, I think, I think there needs to be like a father son conversation. I think you're actually the best one to have this with him where mm -hmm. I, I was there in the moment for comfort, but I'm not a man and I don't want to jump on what may not actually be a toxic masculinity bus either. Maybe man to man, that's not a bad thing, but maybe Papa can sort of help bring out some other feels and also permission. Maybe mm -hmm. you need to hear from a man like a dude, like I'd be bawling my eyes out too. Like it's it's okay that if you did sort of thing. So they sort of had their heart to heart. But my middle finger sort of goes up to this, this place for boys and men where you are boxed in this place and don't have the space to talk about these things. And when you look at a 12 year old and you think you're trying to raise these kids progressively, you realize it's it's innate, like it's ingrained. They're coming out this way, right? Like it's not generations later. It'll mm -hmm. it'll be less. It's gonna be there. So how how do we address it? Like what do we do? So, anyways, that's sort of what my middle fingers. And I also want to add, as I was going through this, I stumbled upon one of your episodes, and I wrote his name down. It was Jake Sticka. Sticka. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah. He, I was just thinking next of him gen. when you were saying were you? that. Next okay. Gen Men. Yeah, so, I was totally thinking of him because so, he talks about yes. that age. Okay, so I yeah. listened to him and it's like, must be meant to be, guys. <laughs> because I listened to him after and I realized he talked about empathy and accountability and that really resonated with me. He talked about how... We got to, you know, I don't want to, I think people should go and listen to this episode because I don't want to butcher it and ruin it. But how I took it was we we are trying to strive with toxic masculinity in some ways to have this empathy for for men and boys and and create some space. And our, our good friend Zach at Canadian Podcast has mm-hmm. the Men Tell initiative happening. So we're trying to create this space for men to talk. But he also, Jake does a really nice job also talking about, but we can't forget that men also have to take accountability as well because that toxic masculinity sort of led to some harsh things and bad things happening. And so we have to look at both. You can't take one away from the other. And how how do we have empathy and accountability in the room together? And I'm like listening to this crying. And it also reaffirmed what I did too, which was like, I don't think this is a a woman to boy convert. I think this right now, this needs to be a man. Like there has to be space for men to also be able to step in and have these kind of conversations with young boys. And it's a good opportunity then a protective mom stepping in and thinking, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm like, I don't actually have the words and knowledge other than they're their child. I don't have, I don't know what else else to contribute right now. Right. So anyways, I just thought that was really neat. And this is why I kept it because I wanted, I wanted to bring up that episode. That was a really cool conversation you guys had. So I don't know, like, like, what are some things you guys are learning and, and guilting and shaming about parenting? Like how would maybe you, you would do something different. Like how would you handle that situation I just shared? Oh, I'm so sim- I'm similar to you. My son she is four. Would handle it just like that. Probably just like that. Yeah, I also am very. Ryan? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I've I've said to my husband before too. It actually is like us both demonstrating that feelings are okay. Yeah. And being safe people to receive them, and I think it is tricky for men and boys in particular. Like yeah. we want them to be vulnerable, but I, as women, sometimes we're not always receiving of that vulnerability yeah. very well. Yeah. So I think it's an important thing to check ourselves too. It's like yeah. we want we want them to be vulnerable and accountable to all those things, and then we're also like, whoa, yeah, no, be strong and hold it yeah, together. Be a man. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a tricky kind of balance that we have to unlearn a little bit too. Mm. But I think it's a little more natural for mm-hmm. us. But I know what you mean. Like, yeah, my son was getting needles. Actually, it came to mind. He was getting his vaccinations for like preschool or whatever, and. I, I rem- I heard this thing and it might have been from Jake or it might have been somewhere else. I can't remember. But just even saying to your kid, you can let out your feelings. Mm-hmm. You can let them out. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And he was getting these needles and he was upset and he was like <gasps> – and doing that, like holding it yeah. in. And I was like, just let it out. It's okay to cry. And then he just bawled. <laughs> yeah. And he's four. And, yeah. let the, you know, it's a little more natural and normal for like little kids to cry. Yeah. But he's obsessed right now with talking about what big kids do. And I was mm-hmm. telling Evan this morning, he came in and was like – do, Evan's son is 14 and he admires him so much Aww. and he's black so they both he's like he's black like me yeah. he's adopted like me like yeah. it's a really big deal yeah. he pointed it out on Sunday yeah he points it out <laughs> he plays soccer he, lo- he likes to play soccer so it, both of them are just he's just like obsessed with him and he was like mom do big kids hug their moms and I was like always every time Yep. Yeah, 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 forever yeah. and ever never stops yeah. but we were talking even about like he has to see it like he has to see ryan and i hug and he has to see ryan be gentle and right like manage his emotions because yeah. that's also like you yeah who your sons are looking to right it's the representation that totally. they see too so and, and that's a really good point it's like the teaching is actually happening you know 24 7 all around and and those moments where we have these conversations with kids are just small little snippets in the day but this environment that they're soaked in is really where a lot of that learning is is coming from because sometimes you have a bad moment and we think okay we'll go back and talk about it which is great yeah however the environment i think does quite you can say damage or a lot of more soaking in than sometimes just a just a conversation so mm-hmm. yes yeah, seeing mom and dad hug seeing dad hug you or what those are things that i think yeah are really impactful and necessary for kids to sort of you know, you got experience with feeling, not just with, and not just in the crisis hearing. moment either, yeah, right? Yeah, like it's yeah, they can gonna, absorb yeah. it better when they're not in the crisis. Yeah. So doing what you did it makes sense. It's like just being calm and being like encouraging and yeah, yeah. That's interesting that you felt that way, kid. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's yeah. a, I think it's a huge deal if you have a if they have a man that they trust in their life, which isn't get the case for everybody. Yes. So I I think that a lot of it has to do with like, do you trust? You know, do our kids trust the men in their lives Yeah, to, to give Great those question. kinds of good examples? But I also think that it's like, I, you know, I'm trying to think of it from the other side to kind of go. And I, I, I've told, I tell my son this all the time. I'm like, yeah, I cry. 
and yeah. I let them see me cry. Right. Uh, that's not something I've been great at, mm. but it's something I'm working at is to actually experience emotion in in real time and kind of like mm-hmm. when I'm experiencing that later. But I would also add to it that it's like, I think one of the good things about it is to say, do you, you know, even for Tara's little guy to kind of go, well, for you to even to respond and say, well, I need hugs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think you need? Mm-hmm. Because I do think that it's like, are we helping our kids to identify what they really yeah. need? Yeah. And I would say, I don't, I didn't learn that very well as right. a kid, you know? And so I would, I would have been definitely that, yeah. that kid. Like I didn't cry. Yeah. You know, and which so, is great. Yeah. Like high fives. <laughs> yeah. And he, actually one of the episodes that comes to mind is a different episode oh. that we did with another Alex he's Cameron. A therapist, yeah. He's a therapist and he, he was just talking about it. And this, he, he goes by the, the tattooed therapist on Instagram. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And he's, he's, a, he looks like a tattooed yeah. guy, right? Yeah. You wouldn't suspect therapist. Anyways, he told a funny story, right? About like some terrible thing that happened to some kid on the, on the field. Yeah. You know, playing rugby or something like that. And a very bad thing happened to him. Mm-hmm. I'll, I remember what it was, but I'll leave it off. And they were like, yeah, get out there and, you know, finish the game. And this guy finishes mm-hmm. the game and with something very significant mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. And then they just like, made it this huge deal that he was so brave and so you know yeah. all these things and he was literally he running around up. there with like a torn like testicle oh, <laughs> you like, couldn't resist i couldn't resist yeah, it was terrible dying right to know too. and he's yeah, out yeah. there like that's yeah. what i decided yeah. to say but it's like he's out there running around with this is this is what's happened to him yeah well and he's not, finishing yeah. the game and everybody's like that's, That's a, man. a man, yeah. And then your threshold, right, moves mm-hmm. further back because yeah. you think, oh, yeah, I, I you handled, you know, like I gave birth. I handled all that pain. So then I should be able to, when I have a cut, be able to deal with this or, you know, I, I did this thing. And I think that's the problem sometimes is we keep pushing it and pushing it yeah. because yeah. we're trying to accommodate what's happening in our in our yeah. environment versus being able to you know, not, not have to yeah. go back. And I think the, are lots of coaches and a lot of these rec leagues and sports. I think there is some of a change happening yep. with some of these coaches that are signing up. A lot of dads that, you know, have kids are joining and lots of interesting conversations to talk to the players. My son was on baseball or in a baseball team and just listening to the one-to-one or the team dialogue and you're like oh something's shifting which is nice because it's not about yeah whatever you hurt this thing <laughs> keep, keep going if, if you can like what you're saying is learn like you know when I when you ask your kid what do you need it's yeah teaching them what how how do I respond and what do I need in the moment it's self-awareness to- it's literally teaching self-awareness yeah, yeah. right to go this is yeah. what I need I need a hug sometimes yeah yeah what do you need right do you need a hug sometimes yeah or yeah. do you just need somebody to listen to you? Do you need somebody to, yeah. Right. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I know I know you guys have to get going soon, so I want to hear a little bit. Oh, man, okay Tara's going to be like, you're a terrible marketer. You yeah. haven't even talked about the Enneagram. Well, yeah. this is exactly what I wanted to get to next, so we'll do <laughs> okay, that. And then, and then we'll see where we go from there. Sure. But that's really the next thing. Oh, I wanted to do shoulder to shoulder. So do you guys okay. want to sure. start with? It. Okay, so here's the Enneagram. Okay, let's talk about that. You were asking about it earlier. Yes. It is, it is a personality typing system. Okay. It essentially operates, though, on what is your core motivation. So there are nine types. On the Enneagram uses nine particular types, uh, and each type has identified a core motivation. So it's less about behavior mm-hmm. and more about core motivation. So what I tell people often is that the Myers Briggs or some of these other personality typing systems yeah. that most people are using in their workplace are identifying a core behavior. You're an introvert, or you're an extrovert, you're right. an emotive, or you're an intellect. You know that that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. The Enneagram is a little bit deeper tool as a there's more layers to it for starters than than most of the other types or the other personality typing systems. Mm-hmm. The Enneagram is one of the oldest. It's mm. a connection between multiple different faiths mm-hmm. from from Hindu to Christianity mm-hmm. to Muslim to all these all these kind of wisdom writers mm-hmm. and people who thought and contemplated about life and purpose and direction and all those kind of things. So so it is a, a pretty robust tool when it comes to that. Mm. The way that I describe it, and and it it operates out of three centers of core centers of intelligence. Mm-hmm. So you've got you've got the body type, uh, where three numbers sit in the body type: the eight, the nine, and the one eight, are nine. body types. The second is the heart, or and they have a core emotion of shame. So the body type has a core emotion of anger. The 
the heart type has a core emotion of shame. That's mm -hmm. the two, three, and the four. And then the head center has a core emotion of fear. And that's the five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. And what you start to discover when you do it is you start to realize that people have these unconscious motivations that are taking place. And that is contributing to their particular behavior. So you can't identify somebody's number by looking at their behavior all of the time. You right. have to actually know them. And, mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways, they have to self-identify as that particular type. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and you actually do that through like multiple different ways of, of asking good questions, helping them to understand the different kind of basics of the each type, which I can go around and do really fast. But, but it's like you're really trying to understand what is the thing that's under the thing that motivates me hmm. if that if that makes any sense mm -hmm. so so do you fill out do you fill out a series of questions you can, or like there, how does the process work? there you can go online you can take online tests okay. the trick with an online test is it's an algorithm right so it's asking you sometimes always or never kind of questions yeah. and then you're based on how you're feeling in that moment you're yeah, quick, yeah you're yeah. quickly answering mm -hmm. those i do actual typing interviews where people come and see me and i ask them a series of questions and then we talk more about it. it's more conversational right. yeah. and it is a part of the growth process so i actually tell people it's not discovering your type yeah is actually part of the growing process and that's where i actually would say the enneagram is not about well, this is my type and this is who I am and yeah. where I am and yeah, what I'm yeah. like. I'm a Gemini, yeah, so exactly. this is what that's I do. It. It's yeah. not that. It's yeah. actually <laughs> so much more than that. It's really more about going, well, this is my, this is what I've come to learn about myself. <laughs> this is what I've come to learn about my unconscious, the unconscious things I do to <laughs> get what I think I want or need to survive. <laughs> and this is how I lose myself in that at times. <laughs> And, uh, and, or like another way I've described it is everybody's kind of figured out a system of how they think they'll be loved. And they just keep doing that over and over right. and over again. And that isn't always accurate. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like this is what I should be getting from you, but then you feel like you're a bottomless pit. Like no matter mm -hmm. how much you tell me I'm good at this thing or that you love me, why don't I believe it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How come you, you, you know, then now you're getting frustrated because you keep saying to me, and this is probably what couples go through, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. but I just told you that you're really good at that or I love you. And you're like, well, I don't hear it enough. And so you're sort of clashing yeah. because what you, what you think you need to hear, but what you want to feel might be like, because you're talking about heart, body, and mind yeah. sort of connecting together. Yeah. And, and really, that's actually what growth looks like. It's like, well, how do you bring all three of those things closer to the middle rather mm -hmm. than living more predominantly in one of those centers? Mm -hmm. And that's why we talk about it. We would talk about centers of intelligence, those three mm -hmm. kind of areas. But, but as you begin to pay more close attention to yourself and what it is that you're doing, that's when you start to realize, well, is that what I need? Is that what I really, is that actually yeah growing me and right. am i really experiencing transformation in this or am i just figuring out how to double down on survival yeah yeah and yeah. like what does that look like so yeah. so if i was to go through the types I, I can go through the types really quickly you know what might be more helpful instead of going through the types why don't you give an example oh, okay. like tell yeah. a story about how yes. in your own life or us even how we've used it at work because the enneagram is super helpful to create healthier, happier relationships yeah. with yourself, but in oh, like yeah. marriages, like uh, my husband and I have used it a lot. We used it at work a lot. Mm -hmm. You've used it in your life with your kids. Like there's so many ex places that it's applicable and that might be easier to understand before understanding yeah. a type. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. talk about me. That's probably what you want me to do. Right? Well, or you can yeah. talk about us. I'm giving you permission to talk about how we <laughs> used it at work because we did use it at work all the time for our relationship to be better. Okay. So I'm an Enneagram seven. Okay. I'm known as the enthusiast. I have a core motivation to avoid emotional and psychological pain. Hmm. I do it unconsciously. So I'm. So you're a comedian. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, I I live in the head center. Yeah. So I I would prefer to operate out of my head center. I make decisions out of typically out of my head, logical, rational, trying to be yeah. at least in my decision making, and and what I what I came to learn about myself was that so much of the things I was doing was an avoidance of pain. So when things get difficult for me, I will find something fun to do. Mm -hmm. I will, I literally, and I don't realize I'm doing it. It's not conscious. Mm -hmm. It's unconscious. I start to do this thing. I don't realize I, when you ask me a question, if I'm not paying attention, I don't realize that when you ask me a question that's actually meant to get to, to my soul story, mm -hmm. 
deeper than my ego story, if that's, if that's mm-hmm, the language mm-hmm. I like to use, that I might think that, that I might have to share something painful. And so I will tell a joke. I'll say something funny or I'll say something that actually sounds really like, wow, that was really hurtful, Mm -hmm. but I'll say it in a, in a funny story. Right. Yeah. And that's very much like me as I'm, I'm over there in that center. It's an avoidance of, and I most definitely have had to learn and grow Mm -hmm. to go, no, I can do pain. I can do hard feelings and sad feelings and those kinds of things. That's a struggle that the seven experiences, the two is is known as the helper and that's what you were yeah yeah the helper helper or the connector Mm -hmm. the connection is really really important to her she lives over in the heart triad Mm -hmm. or the heart center uh with a core emotion of shame Mm -hmm. and tara will often pay close attention to what not only like she pays attention to what the room needs Mm -hmm. and she does that so that she can help it so mm-hmm. she can meet the need. And some of that has to do with her own, you know, if I meet the need, people will love me. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'll get the connection that I want or the, the thing that I need and like some of those kind of things. But it's unconscious that she's doing that unconsciously. Mm-hmm. So she comes at things from a more emotional perspective. How will people feel? How will they experience this thing or that thing? And so it must have sucked for you when I told you from the last recording how what i was how i was interpreting yeah. it right because yeah. that would be the mm-hmm. opposite of what mm-hmm. you would you're probably not saying anything because you want to make sure you're yeah saying the right thing and inviting me well or whatever and i'm taking it in a completely different way yeah, totally so yeah. i apologize for that because no, no, that no. probably is like hard to hear when that's not at all what you're doing no i wasn't overly surprised by it honestly i was like oh i could see how you would get there and then i was like well now you know unconsciously i'm like now i'll work harder to make sure you feel like i like you you know Mm -hmm. but i'm not trying to consciously do that necessarily but i can tell i'm a little bit more like i'm gonna make sure i like you it's we're good with my eyebrows (laughs) i'm gonna talk more for you or whatever yeah Yeah. so one of the challenges though that the two has so i'm just gonna jump straight back in one of the challenges that they have is that they actually aren't very good at identifying their own needs. Mm-hmm. So they give and they give and they give, and they're they're rarely paying attention to what they need. Right. Yeah. So one of the funny stories that we often will tell is like when I was learning the Enneagram, she was working behind the office, right, sitting behind, right behind me. Mm-hmm. I'm reading about the two one day and I go, look, it's really interesting. Like this just said that twos have a really difficult time identifying their own needs. Like, do you think that's true? Mm-hmm. And you just, you were like, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to reading. Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty much what it sounded like. Then a few seconds later, what did you say? You were like, I don't even know what I would ask for. Yeah, I think so. I think you were like, so what do you need? And I was like, I don't even know what I would ask for. Like, what would I even ask for? That's ridiculous. Like, I just was like, like, what? What could people do? Yeah. Huh. And I just jokingly <laughs> was like, I don't know. Like, maybe you need a hug. Mm. Like, what about a hug or whatever? And it was kind of a funny thing. because, then And then I, I think I went back to working. I think you turned around and I start crying. <laughs> <laughs> I hear her like behind me. <laughs> like, oh, holy shit, yeah. what just and happened? You're like, and what's going like... on? Yeah. <laughs> it was so fast. It was just so surprising to me that it could be so simple. Like, I think it was just like, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so out of touch that I could just ask for a hug. And I would feel better, but I'm so afraid of the rejection or I'm afraid that I shouldn't ask for that thing. Yeah. Or How does that make, I don't, make that person yeah, feel that they like, have to give me a hug? Yeah. And, like, what if they didn't want to? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, now I'm putting them in that place. But I hadn't even occurred to me to ask for something so simple. Yeah. So, yeah. It was kind of weird. Devastating. I obviously gave her a hug. Yeah. Like, what are you do, <laughs> yeah right? Thanks for the and every day there. since yeah, and yeah. every day since then actually. But <laughs> but I, I would say that that's just one of those kind of interesting things where you start realizing, well, this is my core. This is who I am. And if I and if we can just pay more close attention to the things that we need and de- and even the things that we're trying to avoid, yeah. we could live so much healthier, mm-hmm. happier lives. Oh, and aware. And aware mm-hmm. lives. Because right? yeah. what we often do is try to change and run away from what we think we know about mm-hmm. who we are. Or sometimes that, yeah, unconscious kind of comes up and you're like, mm, no, that's not it. Let's like fill the time with something else. But to be able to kind of take a moment and realize this is how my feeling or my thoughts, this is how this impacts not just me, but the people around me. And I agree, like we are only here for so long. Yeah. And when we spend so much time trying to get the answer and figure it out, 
I think the key sometimes I find for me is learning more about me, yeah. putting that into me, because then I'll be able to get the answer better, right? Then I know in situations how to tend to people, how to tend to myself, to the people around me, whatever that may be. But we don't do that. Yeah. yeah. You know? And that's that is exactly what ends up happening is yeah. that we just don't pay attention to what is what what's fascinating about it. And I have had people, like I type people. And I've had people read, I have read people the description after a typing interview and say, this is what this type is like. And I've had them break into tears because yeah. they've never realized that. Yeah. And they've never felt so understood or so heard. And I yeah. think that's one of those transformational moments because then all of a sudden you do get to see, oh, that's the thing that that's happening below the surface of even me. Yeah. And yeah. for others. And others, yeah. Like, it's, yeah. We all see differently too. Like instead mm -hmm. of trying to change people to be how you see, you can go, oh, that's how they respond. That's how they're seeing this situation. Yeah. And even what their motivation is. So in your marriage or in a relationship, like when we are working together, you have a different motivation than me. So instead of trying to assume you're going to think the way I do, it was much easier to be like, oh, this is what you're probably worried about or this is what you're going to go after and I'm going to see it differently. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong. Yeah. Like what's interesting, right? In my younger years as a leader, I would often go, if if people could just see, and this is so fascinating. I would literally in my head go, if people could just see this my way, they would experience <laughs> this would yeah. be less painful totally, for everybody. Yeah. Not recognizing that my core motivation is to avoid psychological and emotional pain, which I am assuming everyone else is right. doing. Right. Yeah. I actually do believe there are negative emotions. Mm -hmm. Tara does not. No. She thinks all emotions are important. Mm. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> that, to me, mm -hmm. that's wild. Yeah. I just am like, yeah. no, that can't be right. Right. But I actually have come to a space where I actually would, would fall more on, on her side of things. Because I do, even pain, I actually do think pain is one of the greatest teachers. Mm. And when I can do pain and sadness and some of those, like you named it earlier, like grief and sadness mm -hmm. in the last year, pretty prevalent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to change the environment I was in. Yeah. I had to let that environment go. Yeah. I, there were things I did wrong in trying to do that. There were also things I did right, which right. I'm always trying to remind myself to say. Yeah. But internally, pretty heavy critic of myself. And, mm -hmm. and there are some types that have heavier inner critics than others. And yeah. you start to realize that, that my way of seeing is not, there are eight other ways of seeing. Mm -hmm. And in an, in an office environment, like in a work environment, you can all of a sudden a project you're working on, when mm -hmm. you start recognizing, oh, that person is seeing what could go wrong. Yeah. I'm seeing what could go right. Yeah. That yeah. person's seeing who could get hurt by yeah. making this change in the organization, which was actually yeah. how we worked really well together because I'm a dreamer. Sevens are dreamers. And as a leader, I was a dreamer that actually could say, we're going to do this. Yeah. And I would say that occasionally, like, I think this is so important. We have to do this. And it was so interesting because Tara would often say, love that idea. That's going to be so great. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how so-and-so will feel about this change. Hmm. How, would, mm -hmm. how will they handle mm -hmm. this news? And, and then I could go, oh, because I actually do want to care for people. Right. I, yeah. It's one of my highest mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. Then I could go, okay. We're still going to do this thing because it's important. And I think it's time for us to move forward in this yeah. area. But I'm going to make a point of caring for that person. Yeah. And now, not only then did they feel cared for, mm -hmm. but what I didn't realize was it grew trust mm -hmm. with Tara because she was <laughs> like, oh, no, he's not just going to run over people. You guys are getting like bonus points, yeah. Yeah. right? In, yeah. in this game of figuring out yeah. what mm -hmm. you need. Yeah. yeah. Now and some Tara, who you work, was going to benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say, like, also, it was important for me not to, like, just end the dreaming. Yeah. Like, trying to be like, no, no, we're not going to. That's too yes. scary. Stop dreaming. Yeah. We're not doing that. Right. Because I'm worried about these people. It was always very important for me to support the dreams. Yeah. And figure out how to make it happen without being like, no, no, we can't do that. Yeah. It's like, okay, yes, but how to, how about this? Or how do we make the structure around this so more people will feel like they can be included yeah. in what you're talking yeah. about? It's like you're learning how to speak your language, but you're also learning that uh, there's more than yeah. one language <laughs> out there. And now you're curious about what's Evan's language and then what's the other person that's sitting next to you versus this is the way it always, everyone <laughs> operates in the way that I do. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're right. It comes on like not consciously. No. It does come in that way. And I think what's beautiful about it is that 
when you realize that there's things going on in your brain and your body and your mind that you're, you didn't even realize, you can kind of pull them out and look at them almost like this. When you have this number, it's like a third party thing. So it's not, it's not so intimate and personal. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the, what was your, you're the, what was your name, Terry? You're the, the two, the helper. I'm, the, I'm a helper. Cause maybe I don't want to be known as I don't as like that. that word by the way. Right. But. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. And so you kind of separate outside of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be a really nice way to learn and almost like a gentle way to learn versus mm-hmm. having this shoved down your throat. And yeah. This is who you are, well, you know? You absolutely. So two things that came to mind just now. First of all, when you learn all the types, other ways of seeing, you grow empathy. Mm. So you grow empathy for your spouse. As you start to see your your child's Enneagram type coming up, you start to see empathy for that. The person at the office, whether they're they're, whether they're your superior or whether they're like somebody who's working under you, you start to see that. And what ends up happening is the environment becomes actually more productive and Mm -hmm. more cohesive. Mm -hmm. And that's in your like your marriage becomes more productive. The conversations you have, you go, oh. Yeah. You're a two. Why are you? So you're seeing, are you seeing it like this? Yeah. I had never even considered that. It's not because you're so sensitive yeah. or yeah. you're so yeah. a- emotional. No, it's, yeah. I get it now. Yeah. You're you less can, like, yeah. And say, Stop doing that. Because right. you go, well, no, they actually can't help that shit. Yeah. They're doing that because that's what they were made <laughs> well, for. Well, yeah. And now you're telling me to stop doing something that is who I am. Mm-hmm. You want yeah. me to stop being awesome over here? Yeah. Like, how am I supposed to stop being awesome? Right. right? I can't. You know? Yeah, yeah, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's one of the major, major things. And then the second thing that you literally just named is, and I lead groups, like mm-hmm. I, I lead groups, I've written a book about yes. reflecting on your yes. story, using the tool of the Enneagram, all those things. But what I think is the big gift, and you, you said it, you get to do that at a little bit of an arm's length. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying to even, even my wife or somebody at work, I say, well, I'm like, this This is what I'm like. And, you know, whatever, like all those kinds of things. Instead, I'm going, and I tell my clients this, I I get to say, I'm learning a bunch about myself. Here's what I'm learning about the seven. I'm learning that they are really quite afraid of pain, Mm -hmm. but they know it's important and it's scary. And so they don't want to cause conflict because that Mm -hmm. feels like pain. But I'm going to say this thing. And all of a sudden, you just got new language. Yeah to do something and you weren't saying Evan. Yeah. You were you were literally able to kind of talk about yourself without yeah. talking about yourself. And totally. it feels safer. It does. Yeah. It feels like all of those yeah. kinds of things. And like that's one of the fascinating things is like in my group studies, I have people from across Canada yeah. that will join a group. Yeah. They don't know each other. Right. And they're going, Well, I don't want to talk about myself. And we're like, well here's the good news. You get to talk about you being a six. Yeah. Like, well here's how I experience being a loyalist yeah. or here's how mm-hmm. I get to experience being a challenger right. or, a, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you start to learn from these other people mm-hmm. and you grow empathy for the individuals around you yeah. and you start getting down past the ego of the individual and to the soul of the person yeah. of what's really happening in them. And I yeah. think that's one of the most exciting things about being a coach mm-hmm. and using a tool like the Enneagram to do mm-hmm. it. And it's why I wrote the book because the book is a workbook and mm-hmm. it really is just designed to help people kind of go here are the stories that are are playing in your background yeah and some of them have been healed and they're they're playing in the background in a healthy way and some right. haven't been yeah and actually you could be free if right. you could look at them and when you use the tool of the enneagram you get to go well how did how did the you know the little 3 in me mm-hmm. see this story Mm-hmm. Why did they get hurt so badly here? And it was like, oh, because right, right. yeah, that that hurt so bad, yeah, because that little three really cares about their image. Yeah. And so when so and so said that thing about them in the classroom, it hurt them so right. badly that they've been running from it ever since. That's mm-hmm. right. Hmm. Could and that it, could that be what that was like for me? Like, mm-hmm. it, yeah. let me dip my toes in and check that. It's it's yeah. it's externalizing the problem, mm-hmm. and it's a it's, it's a. It it's a exact and we do and it's a great way with kids i would imagine because when we can do that with kids same same sort of thing it's like how, helping you narrate your story without you know until you're ready to decide if you want to be the star of it mm-hmm. it's it, like we said it's it's so it's less intimate and and i would imagine for couples new couples uh people on an individual basis i think it it can definitely help sort of guide the path to 
you know, there's people sometimes that are towing with, do I want therapy? Do I need therapy? Mm -hmm. Should I go? But I don't really know what to talk about. And it's scary because you're, you don't, you feel like you don't know yourself. And the therapist is going to ask you this intelligent question. You're not going to know how to answer Mm -hmm. what that means to you. Almost kind of like the moment you had with Evan when he asked you, when you turned around and asked you and you kind of had to stop and think because maybe you were never asked, Mm -hmm. what do you need? And you're like, that's what, what is that? Mm -hmm. And, And I think for people that are trying to figure out who they are, what they are. It's a great tool to to utilize to understand and maybe take it to the next level. A hundred percent. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, like I, I'm not a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. But in Me so too. many ways, a lot of what I'm talking to people about is is those deep. It's very therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. It it mm-hmm. really is, and it it's it is a self awareness tool. So yeah, it, it's not just meant to be like, well, this is your type, so yeah. you're like this. I'm, right. I am not condemned to never. I am not forced into not being able to look at the painful things in my story. Yeah. And when I've been able to do that, what I've seen is I've become a deeper person. I've become more genuine in my answers and my mm-hmm. life and in all those things. But the level to which I'm willing to do pain and sadness, I've realized is the level to which I, I can experience and help others experience joy. Yeah. Cause yeah. You, you can't just your joy one of the gifts that the seven gives the world is joy. Yeah. I want that. I want everybody to experience joy. Mm-hmm. The level to which I can help you experience true joy is the level to which I can do pain. Yeah. My own pain. Right. Good and point. If not, then I'm just a shallow guy running around the party. Yeah. And yeah, every yeah. type has that. Like, every yeah. single type. If like, I don't know my needs, then I'm not actually giving generously or able then to you're receive a martyr, them. Actually. Yeah, you are. And that's what yeah. happens with the two. If I'm not actually like paying attention to what I need and yeah. taking care of my needs, I'm giving to get my needs met in sneaky ways. Right. Yeah. And so I'm not being the generous person that I want to be or yeah. connecting with you in a deep way. I wash the sheets to be able to get someone to say, yeah. Yeah. hey, thank you for doing that. You know, yeah. so like, yeah, we look for ways, these, these ways to get people to want to say what we need back but mm-hmm. and like you said half the time we don't even realize we're doing that and then we're upset because we're like how come my partner or my child or my boss didn't recognize mm-hmm. this lovely thing that happened here and you know yeah and i think you know when you talk about friendships relationships all those kind of things it's, yeah. it's easy now for me to kind of go okay but what do you need today tara yeah and also to make sure that she knows no i love you before you do anything for me yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not about that. Right. And yeah. then then she's free to do what she wants to do instead mm-hmm. of what she is driven to do, yeah. which is to meet needs. Right. So mm-hmm. people will love her and, and, and so on and so on. So in so many ways, the, the great gift you give the world yeah. is the curse you bear. Mm. And in, in a lot of ways, that's language that I'll use is that actually, yeah, the great gift you give the world is that you can see the needs of the world mm-hmm. and you can meet those needs. The curse you bear, this is very difficult to you, for you to identify your own. Yeah. The great gift I give the world is the sense of joy. I can teach people really hard things. Yeah. And make them laugh at the same time. Right. That's shoulder to shoulder is a little bit what that's about. For can us. we talk about that? Yeah. yeah. Shoulder. Yeah. 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 In so many ways, like. Do you want to give the spiel? Like well, it's you out already going? are talking. No, I've been talking a lot. So I'm going to drink water. I've been need some water. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, for about a year we've been planning and thinking about whether we should do this series or not. But it's obviously – it's about um, really having – listening to stories and sharing stories of inclusion and belonging, specifically exploring the relationship between like the church and the LGBTQ plus community, Mm. which after you've heard some of our story, that's obviously something we deeply care about and really felt like we didn't give a lot of voice to publicly when we were in the organization we were in before. And it felt like it was a story that needed to be told. It also felt like there were voices that were not being heard. And we wanted to be able to share some of that and also help people maybe who were in the middle of the quieter middle is what we call it, mm. not the extremes. Cause we both, you know, we're obviously affirming we're all, we're trying to yes. be allies. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end, you're probably like, you're set in your ways. You may yes. not be exploring our series for that, but if you're in the middle, if you're in an organization or you've been, you've left one because of this and you're trying to figure out if there's a space for you, or if you're an LGBTQ plus person, there is a space for you with mm-hmm. people of faith. And so that's what it's all exploring. It's like, ex-pastors it's current pastors trying to do this in their their church yeah. and then it's like individual stories as well so we have a parent of a transgender person we have evan's daughter we went to lethbridge and talked to university students 
who are part of that community. And our friend Kevin is a part of it with us and he's sponsoring it. And because also we didn't want to do a series about the LGBTQ plus community being very straight people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's good <laughs> without, thinking. Yeah. Without, you know, someone in that. And he is a person of faith too. And Yeah, that was the big thing we were just concerned about. Like so often we talk about the marginalized or those who yeah. are outed yeah. Yeah. at arm's length. Yeah. We don't include them in the conversation. No, no, I know. I can speak from race. Absolutely. I have I have a lot of great white friends who think that the best way to support is to speak for people of color and people of color haven't had a voice for all these years. And so on one hand have allowed it too, but on the other hand are saying, thank you. Like my point is thank you, but like I, I can I need to be able to get up and say that myself. So help me in the background. Get to a place where I can get to that. And I think that is so important that you guys really thoughtfully considered this project that you're doing because you have a lot to offer. You have your experience. You're experiencing it as a father. However, having somebody from the community that has lived experience is a really inviting way for others to learn. And I also think for our listeners who maybe have family members or Mm -hmm. friends, kids that are part of the community and and you're not sure what this means and what are all these letters with LGBT, uh, you know, like what is that? And why are people being the way they are? And why can't, you know, like all these sort of questions in between. I think it's a really good opportunity for folks to jump on and listen to this series because the best place to learn when we're not sure we're in between is stories yeah. of, of folks that have had lived experience. And you have all sorts of sounds like different voices that mm-hmm. are, are part of this. That so. was really our goal. And, you yeah, know, it's good funny, for you. I'm you know, really, this is like, I just want to, I know you're going to say something, but like, <laughs> this is big. I think this is really good. Yeah, I was sitting here with goosebumps and I think mm. good for folks like you that understand, you know your role, you know where to stay, but you also know you have, you have like an opportunity and you're using it and doing it in a way that is so needed. So I just think like this is amazing. And I really hope Shoulder to Shoulder takes off and we can support it and, and help you. folks get their stories out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think and so all I was going to add to that was like what, I, what I've realized is the Unpacked started out with just me talking one voice yeah yeah right and it has grown into two voices and the guests that we have and i think that what what we what i'm learning and seeing now is that our goal is to, is to continue to pass the mic around yeah and give other people a voice to tell their story mm-hmm. and why they're experiencing mm-hmm. what they're experiencing or how they ex- have experienced something in the past so yeah. rather than us saying we know all the things totally it's yeah. like no but unpacked has grown mm-hmm. it's grown enough that it there really are is. people listening and so we should we should be very responsible with the voices you know, like allowing actual people to give yeah give voice to their own stories instead of us trying to articulate it for them. That was why Kevin joined us. Kevin is, he's, he's a gay man. He's, he's actually a big part of the reason why my, the whole question around inclusion and belonging Mm -hmm. and all of that started. He started coming to our church Mm -hmm. like 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I had to answer questions. Yeah. I had my own, my own questions. And he walked with us, me in particular through, so much of that and so it made such sense to include him in it mm-hmm. so you get to hear our you get to hear kevin and my story you get to hear a little bit of tara in my stories mm. and, and but but more importantly you get to hear all these individuals yeah. who have experienced so many different ways of how they felt yeah how they came out mm-hmm. what it feels like to be out and really how we can create mm-hmm. safe places yeah for everyone to belong like not the accept force yes. but just the actual Mm-hmm. Here are the spaces and how we can do that. Right. Yeah. And in our particular context, it was, you know, we were, I was a church person, 30 years pastor. So it made a lot of sense to go, no, this is, this is the kind of context we're going to frame yeah. it in. But I think that anyone of any faith community mm-hmm. would be, or other would be able to hear that and go, no, what does it make? What does it mean to make space to come shoulder to shoulder beside and that? You know, yeah. our first episode, we talked about, well, what is that about? And it's like, no, it means to stand beside. Mm-hmm. Not, and, not and, one behind the yeah. other. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Yeah. That was what I was going to say. That was it. Great, great minds. Think <laughs> yeah, they do. They really do. <laughs> yeah. All right, you two. Okay, so is there is there anything that you wish I had asked or that you wanted to share today that maybe we didn't get a chance to? I don't think so. Other than I just, I really do hope that people see life 
and the, as the opportunity to learn and grow, yeah. to be curious about things and to identify when they're afraid. Because mm-hmm. I think if you can identify when you're afraid, then you can start going, of what? Mm-hmm. What's so scary out there? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, growth is, I'm, you know, I'm going to fill up my little thing. Yeah, what we did. We did. Yeah. Um, I, I had friends for my birthday give these little affirmation cards and you guys are the first ones to do it. So as we wrap up, why don't you read what you got? I have right here, right now. Right here, right now. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, and you get to write a little note in the back. Yeah, that's yeah. such a fun little practice. I'm also super grateful you decided to have us on too because the things you're asking and the stories you're trying to tell and your own perspective is super important. And I think it's just really valuable and it's always fun to do this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I think it actually will help people grow. And being in a podcast setting, it actually is really accessible and less threatening. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with everything you said. And thank you. You're thank welcome. you for that. Okay, remember I said there was all kinds of layers to the Enneagram? Yeah. Well, there are three types. There, There is an orientation to time layer. <laughs> okay. So understanding your orientation to time. Three types are futurists. Yeah. Three types are present. And three types focus predominantly on the past. Mm. Ironically, Tara lives in the present tense. Oh, and, look and at I so got that. Right here, yeah. right now. That's is amazing. Like I immediately thought that actually yeah. when Aww. I saw it. I was like, that's so funny. It also yeah. matches your outfit. Oh, like yeah. You have to pose, but yeah, totally to take a picture. Does. I'm going to get a picture of you too after okay. that. Yeah. What'd you get, Evan? Do what you love. Aww. Yeah. And uh, honestly, what comes to mind is just what we were just talking about. I, I tell my wife all the time, Tara hears this from me all the time. I'm like, if I love seeing people experience growth mm-hmm. and transformation, and I love walk, walking beside them. And I know that sometimes that gets messy, mm-hmm. but it's always with a great intention and purpose. Mm-hmm. And, um, I love it. There isn't anything. That was the thing that was the big draw for me as a pastor was I got to walk beside people and see them experience growth and encourage that and mm-hmm. and then go to the scary places with them and yeah. all of that. You can't do one yeah. if you can't do the other, right? <laughs> yeah. We can't just always be in the yeah. light. We also have mm-hmm. to go to the dark sides too. Yeah. So so it's a fitting question for me. It's, yeah. it's legitimately like I started this business, this company of coaching because that's what I really love. Yeah. Is seeing people grow and and my wife is like, oh, I'll, I'll tell her, oh, today I had this great conversation. Yeah. They, they, they saw this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that they saw this thing, they can be free. Mm-hmm. And that, that doesn't mean today, but they can be. Yeah. There's an opportunity there. So yeah, that's what I'm going to be writing on my card. I love it. I can't wait. Yeah. I got Don't Be Afraid to Try, which is also very fitting. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. We talked a lot about fear too today. And yeah. How fear paralyzes us. So. Can't let that paralyze us. Okay, so can you guys drop your plug for me one more time? I did share at the beginning, but if folks are going to log on and want to listen to your podcast, they want to follow you, where is the best place to find you both? Yeah, we're like wherever you listen to your podcast, The Unpacked Podcast. And then we also have like an Instagram and a Facebook that's The Unpacked Pod. Perfect. So you can follow us there. And then our individual handles are on that too yeah, if you want to. Follow Tara, Tara Lindsley. <laughs> Perfect. Dot. CA. CA. Yeah. On Instagram. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Recess kind of Creek places. Coaching. Yeah. And then at Recess Creek is you. Is, is yeah. me on Instagram and yeah. some of those kind of places. And we, we often will share between the two. Mm-hmm. Our website is unpackedpod.ca. Yeah. And there's tons of stuff in there. All our episodes are in there. Even some of the Enneagram ones are like. Group, yeah. We have like playlists and stuff. Oh, we did an well. adoption series. So that's a series we've done. And then we have a couple of Enneagram ones and then shoulder to shoulder separated out too. So if you don't want to listen to all of them, yeah, you can find stuff. There's a lot yeah. of yes. different uh, topics to yeah. connect to. Then you can buy my book. Yeah. You, so you, can you, join the you group. also you have can... your, yeah, your book. Where can we, where can we find your book? Uh, you can go to, you can go to unpackedpod.ca and there's okay. a link right there. Actually forward slash recess book. Okay. So recess, as in my favorite subject in school. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, also a great cartoon. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing groups. I'm actually doing a, a group on that book. Okay. Uh, this summer. Nice. And so the kind of registrations open for all that, and you can find all the links there and and all that stuff. And then individual coaching, you can you can literally get a typing interview, so you could sign up, and I can do a typing, and I'll type Perfect. you. Oh, that would actually that, be eh? really fun. Oh my gosh. It would be, yeah. <laughs> I think you love and it. Couples I and like, think you love it. couples and business partner coaching, mm-hmm. which is really cool too. Yeah. I do uh, some of the corporate stuff that I've been doing is with, mm-hmm. with business owners who are like trying to figure out how do you do a partnership Yeah, and 
How much do you do like couples? a marriage. How do you yeah, do much, it is it like is. a marriage, right? Yeah. yeah. It's exactly, yeah. Right. It's pretty, yeah. It's exactly what I tell people. I'm like, well, it's pretty much the same package. It's, yeah, yeah. You're saying it like I'm a lot of work. That's what <laughs> it just sounds like. <laughs> yeah, he's like, are you picking up what he's putting yeah, out? Yeah, I love it. He was like, yeah. 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 <laughs> so grateful to get invited here, though. And, yeah. and I'm oh, glad so we got to come and do yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Fun. I'm glad Telus screwed my yeah. um, <laughs> back to the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm really happy that you both were able to come down as well today. Uh, and also for those that are listening today, you know that these conversations are door openers. So if there's anything that sort of got you today or you're curious about, you can reach me at info at MFU podcast or on Instagram at MFU podcast. Or if you have any other other topic ideas, please let us know. Otherwise, thank you to the both of you for coming on today. Uh, have a great day.